and welcome to the 18th meet of the 18th meeting of the economy committee. Um, obviously, due to ongoing safeguarding measures in place. Can everybody who's on the line please mute? There you go. <laughs> um, so, so, due to ongoing safeguarding measures in place. Um, in regards to COVID-19, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via teleconference. Our witnesses will also be briefing the committee via teleconference. The meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly web page. Um, and members will know that they can mute their tablets by pushing F4. Um, item 1 then, apologies. We have apologies from Stuart Dixon and then there is no other No other's policy. chair, no. Um, item number two then is the draft minutes. Um, they are, can be found at pages five and eight um, of your packs for um, both meetings last week on the 26th and the 27th of May. Our members content that the minutes are an accurate reflection of the meeting. Great, great. Yeah. Okay, item number three then, um, chairperson's business. Um, Peter, I just wanted to raise an issue in relation to that. Um, yesterday, obviously, the motion passed in the Assembly around seeking an extension um, for yeah. Brexit in terms of the negotiations. Um, and just with that in mind, um, I thought it would be an idea to write to um, Michael Gove, as Joint Chair of the Joint Committee, um, seeking a response around that. Obviously, great impact in terms of local business and um, economic planning, particularly in light of the impact of COVID-19. Okay. Members agree? Agreed. Agreed. Yep. Right, Janine, how's your sound? Is it okay? It's going in and out, actually. We'll, we'll look and see if there's other ways to do that, but I think we're probably stuck with it as it is. But are you in a landline or a mobile? I'm just in a mobile. Do you have a landline? No, no. Okay, okay. Well, we, we'll do our best and persevere and hopefully. It will work out. Sorry, Chair, it's just that no, 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 it's I've had real problems with that line. Um, and as was similarly, um, the HMRC has put in place 50 million of investment for um, business training. Um, and just it would be useful to find out how local businesses are able to access yeah. that funding in terms of all Brexit planning. Um, and that, that we could maybe find out some information in relation to that yep. as well. Yep. Members agreed, yes. Agreed, yeah. Yep, perfect. Yeah. Um, okay. And also, just in relation to the, the letter to Michael Gove, yeah. it is, um, there was a kind of a promise of a business engagement forum. Um, and if we could explore that with him as well and see if, there, if that's actually being put in place. Perfect. Our plans to do so and involve local business as well. Okay. Okay, what happens when I leave the building? <laughs> Um, okay, then moving on to item number four, um, we are having an oral briefing this morning by a teleconference by Sony um, on the energy strategy and all our witnesses are online, so uh, members can find a clerk's memo at page 16, a uh, briefing presentation from Sony at page 18 and then biographies of the Sony team at page 36. Um, so I'd like to welcome to the meeting Joe Aston, who is Managing Director of Sony, Alan Campbell, who is Head of Grid Infrastructure, and David McGowan, who is Senior Lead Engineer. Um, if you would like to make a, an opening statement, and then um, members can um, ask questions afterwards. Can you hear us all okay? Yes, it can indeed. Thank you very much, Chair and um, Committee members. Uh, good morning. We're very, very pleased to be invited and be given this opportunity to brief the committee this morning on the development of the Department's energy strategy for Northern Ireland. We do have a short presentation um, which will set out what we do, outline our strategy for 2020 to 2025, and it's really focused on addressing climate change, so, and so it's very apt for the development of an energy strategy for for Northern Ireland, and in the presentation, we will also reflect some of the key recommendations that we would have in the context of the energy strategy. So, if we move on to slide two in the deck, which is a, an essential service for Northern Ireland, I mean, Sony is the electricity system operator for Northern Ireland. We're responsible for delivering a safe, secure, and reliable supply of electricity 24 7, um, 365 days a year, now and into the future. We have a headquarters here in East Belfast. 
where we have the Northern Ireland Grid Control Centre, and about 120 staff are located there, although currently all working from home except for perhaps about a dozen of us. And we also have an office in Armagh. As a monopoly service provider, we are regulated by the utility regulator for Northern Ireland. Our service is provided through a rigorous price control process, and we are currently with the utility regulator in relation to our price control for the 2020-25 price control. If we move then on to slide three, operating the electricity system, I thought it would be helpful to the committee if I outlined the different elements of the electricity system and indeed distinguished between the Northern Ireland Electricity Networks and Sony's roles and responsibilities. The diagram shows the source of energy, the, the generators, the larger transmission network, which Sony is responsible for planning and making sure that it is fit for the future. Uh, NIE Network builds and owns this transmission network. They also build, own, and operate the smaller distribution network, which connects directly to homes, farms, and businesses. And finally, on the slide there, we have the retailers, the Power NI, the GoPower, who sell electricity to the end consumer. In addition to being responsible for ensuring that generation capacity is adequate to meet demand, we are also responsible for trading of electricity via the single electricity market, a market that operates on the island of Ireland and trades approximately $2 billion per annum. In running the market, we are responsible for matching the supply from generators and demand from consumers to deliver the most cost-effective outcomes for consumers while ensuring security of supply. We, traditionally, generation was made up of large thermal plants such as Karut, Bally, Lumford, Kilkira, and indeed we still have them on our system. However, over the last decade, we have seen an increasing amount of decentralized renewable generation, onshore wind developments, domestic as well as solar farms, connecting to the extent that they now contribute over 40% of our power source. Wind makes up the majority of this, so approximately 33%, and because of its variable nature, creates really quite a challenge in keeping the system stable. However, over the last three to five years, we have been world leading in terms of developing our tools and our systems and how we operate the, the, the system to be able to absorb 65% of that variable renewable energy on the system at any one time. And in our strategy going forward, our ambition is to increase that further to 95% because that's when we'll get maximum value from those renewable sources. If we move on then to slide number four, the energy transition. The 40% of our electricity being supplied from renewable sources is, of course, a very positive thing. And it's the electricity sector is seen as a key enabler to address climate change. If we are to achieve our ambition, and indeed the ambition of the executive's new decade, new approach, then we must continue this journey of moving away from fossil fuels and ultimately have our electricity supplied from renewable sources. This will require radical change and what is frequently referred to as an energy transition. This is because electricity will be used for more purposes with heat and transport looking to electricity as a clean source of enabling those sectors to reduce their carbon footprint, thus resulting in a higher demand for electricity and renewable energy sources. On this energy transition journey, we are seeing the sources of generation connecting in a more decentralized way. Households and businesses are now able to generate their own electricity, manage their energy use, and even aid us in managing the system with, for example, demand side management. However, to facilitate this, we need to make the electricity grid stronger and more flexible. This, in turn, will require more infrastructure and investment to deliver a green energy system that is ready for the energy transition. And now if we move on to slide number five. In October last year, we launched our strategy for the period 2020 to 25, which is shaped by two factors climate change and the impending transformation of the energy sector. We also revised our purpose so that to that of transforming the power system for future generations. It is not just about grid development or connecting renewables. It is about how we trade our energy, how consumers relate to it, use it, and pay for it. To 
be successful will require radical change and a holistic view. We will need to engage with consumers and support them in helping us to save our planet and reach the net zero carbon by 2050. We are very supportive of the department, this committee and the leadership of Minister Dodds in progressing this Northern Ireland energy strategy. Move on then to slide six. And this slide really sets out the key things whenever we look at our strategy over the five year period that we believe need to be delivered if we're going to achieve uh, a net, the trajectory to net zero by 2050. In defining the strategy and in fulfilling our planning role, we see our primary role as leading the electricity sector on sustainability and decarbonisation in our area of expertise. We cannot do this alone, however, and look to other leaders in their area of expertise. We work in partnership with Northern Ireland Electricity Network. In fulfilling our planning role, we have analysed and published three credible scenarios that would deliver different levels of renewables on the system and carbon reduction to contribute to achieving net zero by 2050. One such scenario is for 70% of our electricity to be sourced from renewable sources by 2030, married with a 45% reduction in CO2 to achieve this will require up to 1,600 megawatts of additional renewable sources connecting to the system. Approximately 465 million invested in the grid as reflected in our 10-year network development plan. Maximization of the value of existing and new interconnectors, and I'll come back to that later. Further innovation by Sony to develop our system tools and how we operate the market to be able to support 95% of renewables on the system at any one time. The single electricity market will have to evolve to incentivize the right level of flexibility and to ensure competition is fair and equitable to attract new investors. Sony will also need to walk the talk and reduce its own emissions. Our goal will be to achieve the required increase in renewables while minimizing the addition to the new infrastructure. We want to maximize our existing assets. And moving on now to the next slide, slide seven. We are in no doubt that we have to address climate change and that to do that, radical change will be necessary. This will take a holistic view of the power system, the grid, the market, and the interconnection with neighboring markets. All will be crucial. We can't look at any of them in isolation. I will now just briefly speak to each of these important elements and the degree of change that is necessary. So moving to slide number eight, which shows a picture of our grid, the existing transmission grid in Northern Ireland. I suppose there's quite, there, there are a number of aspects worth observing. One is that the larger 275 kV lines predominate in the east of Northern Ireland. That the network in the west is more limited, served by smaller 110 kV lines. And yet it is the west of Northern Ireland that has the rich sources of onshore wind connected and looking for connection to, in many cases, a saturated grid. As part of our planning role, we develop a 10-year network development plan, which sets out infrastructure requirements. Within our current plan, we assess that about 465 million infrastructure investment is required, which of course includes our long-awaited north-south interconnector, and two other major reinforcements from Maharafelt to Kilkira and Ballylumford to Castlereagh. There are also a myriad of other projects within our, our plan. If we are serious about meeting our commitment to deliver net zero by 2050, with a trajectory of 70% of renewable supply electricity by 2030, then it is crucial that we are facilitated by a prompt planning decision process. The North-South Interconnector has been in planning now for over a decade. Turning, having said that, and just before I move to the next slide, we remain very strong advocates of consultation, community engagement, and indeed community funds. So we are not suggesting for one moment that in terms of revising or looking to the planning decision process that we remove any of those important elements. Moving to slide nine now, which is uh, the wholesale electricity market. The single electricity market on the 
island of Ireland went live in 2007, and it gave consumers both north and south access to economies of scale in the trading of electricity. In October 2018, a redesigned and more integrated market was introduced, which complied with the requirements of the European liberalised market for trading of electricity. This new market has brought more efficient trading of electricity across interconnectors. It provides closer to real-time trading and pricing signals, which are important features if we are to maximise the value of renewable energy sources and engage with consumers in contributing and addressing climate change. It also introduced a competitive auction process to provide security of supply. The outcome of this first auction, reducing the cost of such capacity by £15 million per annum for consumers in Northern Ireland. The committee may also be aware that in the most recent auction, securing capacity for 2023-24, the two new 205 megawatts open cycle gas turbines at Karut were successful and that this will see the old coal units close. A very good outcome for the climate and indeed for Northern Ireland. The new single electricity market introduced signals and rewards for generation that are flexible and could respond to fluctuating energy demands, including demand side management. In this new energy world of transition, it will be important that the single electricity market continues to evolve to optimize costs and solutions. Currently, the wholesale electricity costs contribute about 65% of consumers' bills, and therefore it's a very significant element in this change. Moving on then to slide 10. This slide really shows you the level of interconnection between neighbouring energy markets. And those with shaded, shade being attached are at varying degrees of consideration. As renewable energy becomes the main source of power across connected countries, the more interconnection that exists, the more access there is to a larger market and the efficient trading of renewable energy. This not only facilitates a green energy system, reducing the carbon footprint, but also provides added system security and sharing of reserve. With the drive to a green, to a green economy, many companies are seeking to increase their level of interconnection. In Ireland, we have the Celtic interconnector, which will add 700 megawatts, and a green link interconnector seeking to add 500 megawatts. DB is looking to at least double its current level of interconnection with Europe. And with our rich indigenous energy source, Northern Ireland and Ireland could become part of the single, as part of the single electricity market, could become exporters of energy. However, moving on to slide 11. If Northern Ireland consumers are to benefit from added interconnection and from opportunities from the energy transition, it is absolutely crucial that the north-south interconnector is realized as soon as possible. The second north-south interconnector is required to ensure efficient operation of the single electricity market. Today, its absence is a major constraint on the trading in the market, in the SEM market, and costs consumers in the order of 20 million pounds per annum. With increasing levels of renewables over the next decade, this cost is expected to double. Such a major constraint between Northern Ireland and access to larger energy markets will also act to disincentivize investors as it will increase the likelihood of their energy being curtailed with a resultant loss in revenue. We understand the Department for Infrastructure report will be going to the Minister in the coming weeks and we would really urge for a prompt decision in relation to this. Moving on then to slide 12. Additional important elements of the energy transition include new technologies, and it is important that we do not pick winners, but that all current and new technologies are able to compete. Digitization, information, smart technology will be key to the future transition and the empowerment of consumers. Time of use tariffs and the ability to store energy are potential game changers. This revolution is upon us, and we would urge the committee to embrace it and to avail of the opportunities it can bring to our economy. We are pleased that the development of the Northern Ireland Energy Strategy embraces all of these factors. Moving on then to slide 13. 
in fulfilling our planning role and ensuring that the system will meet the needs of tomorrow, Sony has developed three credible scenarios to facilitate delivery of government policy of a net zero carbon by 2050. This picture shows uh, one of those scenarios addressing climate change, and this reflects delivery of 70% renewable energy married with a 45% greenhouse gas reduction. However, it will require individuals and organizations to choose to adopt, to adopt long, low carbon technologies and to meet their transport and heating needs. We see a large increase in electric vehicles and heat pumps. We see uh, domestic oil boilers, which populate 67% of our households moving to heat pumps. We see changes in building regulations and the retrofit schemes resulting in, in heat energy efficiency. Policy measures must stimulate growth in renewable generation with targets being met. The re renewable mix will become diversified. Smart metering and innovative technologies will enable increased flexibility and demand management. And these are all, these will all need to happen and we'll be looking for the NI energy strategy to support them. Moving on then to slide 14. From the presentation, uh, I hope you will have realized the importance of having an NI energy strategy with strong underpinning policy in place as soon as possible. It was the previous strategic energy framework that set and supported the target of 40% renewables on the system by 2020 and that has resulted in that being met in advance last year. We are very encouraged by the holistic and interdepartmental approach being taken by the department. We made a comprehensive response to the department's call for evidence in March this year and continue to support its development, participating in the thematic working groups, working in partnership with NIEN to give of our expertise. We also welcome the committee's micro-inquiry and have responded to it and are very pleased to be here briefing today and to answer your questions. The next few slides will just summarize some of our key recommendations. So slide 15, a strong energy strategy underpinned by measurable targets, a clear roadmap with an agile review mechanism are keys to, successes, to success. It is important to focus on outcomes and hence the importance of targets. However, with the level of radical change and with emerging technologies, it is important to include a midterm review, which acts as checks and balances to ensure that the roadmap remains on the most optimal one. These, rev these reviews cannot, however, act as blockers to progress. We support a 70% renewables target by 2030, but key to success will be the accompanying transport, heat and energy efficiency policies if we were to deliver the 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Without grid investment and delivery, none of this will be possible, and hence the need for planning reform to facilitate timely decision-making and evidence to investors that Northern Ireland is open for business. Moving on then to my second slide on key recommendations, slide 16. Informed consent from Community is a fundamental part of the equation if we are to meet future targets in a timely manner. We support and believe that schemes such as community funds are important for Northern Ireland. This would, however, require a policy direction and oversight by the utility regulator, as all of these funds will add to consumers' bills. Future energy policy should consider how a fair and just transition is achieved, and measures to support the most vulnerable in society including financial support mechanisms, should be considered. It will be important to engage with consumers to play their part in the move to net zero carbon and to help them and to provide them with advice in terms of how they can contribute. Sony would advocate a study on the development of offshore renewables in the context of net zero carbon by 2050. Depending on the location of such a development, there could be better utilization of the current network infrastructure. However, what is also important if we are to achieve this increase in renewables and benefit from the economic opportunities it can bring is consideration of routes to market, the need to have a competitive support mechanism which our neighbouring Ireland and GB energy markets already have. What is also fundamental is a collaborative and partnership approach to the transition. And I'm just coming to my last couple of slides. Slide 17. 
uh, the green economy opportunities. A strong, diverse and stable energy sector is necessary if jobs and expertise are going to grow in Northern Ireland. We never really recovered from the recession in 2008 and I would encourage a move to a green economy to be embraced as a measure for the recovery of COVID-19. The energy transition and the move to a green economy brings opportunities for Northern Ireland. In discharging our role and in this short presentation, we have reflected on a number of key and fundamental enablers all of which will deliver job opportunities, innovation, attract investment, increase our competitiveness, and deliver the executive's new decade, new approach, ambition to address the climate emergency, committing to deliver net zero by 2050. I believe Northern Ireland is uniquely placed to make the green economy a success. We have significant natural resources. Offshore wind, in particular, offers an excellent opportunity to diversify our energy mix. We have an expert consultation sector, construction sector and a highly skilled digital workforce. Data will be central to the energy transition. And finally, my last slide. Working together with a ministerially endorsed energy strategy that has clear targets and is underpinned by strong heat, transport and energy efficiency policies and an agile framework, we can make this happen. As the operators of the electricity system and the wholesale market, we have a fundamental role in supporting Northern Ireland's response to climate change crisis. Sony is committed to transform the power system for future generations to make the changes that will allow a fundamental move away from carbon emitting generation. Without evolving and strengthening the electricity system, this transition to renewable energy simply can't happen. We can't do this without a strong holistic energy strategy. And we have to do this. And I believe we can do this together. Thank you very much for your time and very happy to take questions. Thank you, Joe, um, and for that really um, useful and um, informative presentation. Um, and obviously, it's something that um, is, is, a, is a priority for us in terms of the committee work, but also more generally as well. Um, you, you mentioned there about how there's a need for strong guidance and governance in terms of the energy strategy um, and to um, uh, for to have those targets as well. Um, obviously, there there is a key role there for a climate change act in terms of the the targets and in particular sectoral targets to be able to meet um, the the aims of the um, the the strategy. Uh, would you agree with that? Yes, I would. I mean, I think the climate change act can do nothing other than aid the uh, transition. I don't, however perceive that that's a barrier for us being able to get on with, with making it happen. But I do think it would be helpful. Yeah. Um, obviously, you mentioned the, the real economic benefits of e or decarbonisation in the green economy um, in your presentation. Um, and we obviously have great potential in that, that area in terms of the ability to grow the green economy or require investment, definitely, but um, be able to deliver longer term and sustainable economic benefits as well. Um, how do you think that the prioritisation of the growth of the green economy um, can chart a way out of the current economic crisis that we, we face in terms of, of COVID as well? I, mean, I think that, uh, I mean, as I mentioned there, the wholesale energy price contributes about 65% of consumers' bills. And that's really subject to a lot of volatility in terms of commodity prices. As we move to renewable energy, um, and we're already seeing this in the single electricity market and in the opening up of the markets through interconnection, the reducing of that, the energy cost as, as, as we've got our natural resource in terms of wind. However, to get there will require this investment in our grid, uh, which, which will cost money. But again, it will have a po very positive effect in terms of the economy, in terms of creating jobs, um, in terms of attracting investment. And so I, I think that the energy transition, as well as being almost a, a crisis in itself, because I think we have to do this for future generations and we have to act now because the evidence is there of the damage that's been created. But I also think it, it actually will help us in terms of um, recovering and coming out of the, the, the crisis that, that we're in our economy and indeed economies across the world are finding themselves in. 
And um, just finally for myself before I bring in other members, um, you talk in the presentation about bringing coal off stream by 2023. Um, obviously, there's a significant um, um, amount of power generated from coal <coughs> in the north. I think something like a fifth is generated from coal. Um, and phasing this out would, be, would need to obviously be part of like the just transition. Um, how, what role do you think there is in terms of that model um, of moving forward in, in respect of moving away from fossil fuels and how, how we go about doing that effectively? All the, the various partners. Yeah, I mean, I think I think in terms of the coal one, we're, we're quite fortunate in that we have had success in the recent capacity auction in that at the Karut site, we they, there's two uh, 205 megawatts that have been successful coming out of that. So in fact, the coal will exit at the same time as new thermal plant coming on board. So I think from that particular one, I, I think that's, that's a great win-win for everybody in terms of the climate, in terms of jobs and in terms of having new generation in Northern Ireland, because while, while still moving to 100% renewables, we still see ourselves being reliant upon thermal flexible plant in terms of reliability, particularly given the volatility of, of wind. In terms of, 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 of a fair transition, I think the concern is, is that we will be empowering consumers going forward. We will be providing them with information in terms of time of use targets. They, some will, will have their own solar panels. Some will have small wind turbines in their, in, their, in their locality that they will be able to avail of. You might have some community schemes going forward. And I think the concern is that those more vulnerable in our society will not avail of those opportunities. And I guess that's where we really need to consider whether or not there are some financial incentives or mechanisms that we want to put in place. I think as well as that, this is where the roadmap becomes very important in the holistic picture, is that we really want to be looking at how we optimize this transition rather than just letting it happen, whatever, wherever it happens, how it happens. I think that we want to have set out a very clear roadmap and perhaps even identified buckets and working to develop health communities. And, and again, one of the we do have to the committee's interested, Mr. Allen can pick up on a few um, community schemes and funds that are used elsewhere that we could perhaps avail of. Okay, thank you. Um, Sinead? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Hi, Joe uh, and Alan and David. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was um, very interesting, and it's an area that I'm actually particularly interested in, and it fits into all of, of, of our discussions recently and how we um, drive our economy forward after uh, the, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and I think, you know, a, a positive energy strategy is very, very much part of that uh, and the sustainability and the, the Green New Deal, et cetera, et cetera. But I would just like to kind of come back to just one, one uh, bit of it. You said, Joe, that we need to add another um, 1,600 megawatts of renewable uh, to the grid by 2030 and that the north-south interconnector is critical to that. Um, and I believe that that is one of, of our um, levers that we need to, to activate now very, very quickly as an executive. But given the fact that the interconnector still doesn't have planning permission, realistically, how quickly can Sunny deliver that capacity that we actually need? I mean, I think that, I mean, the, uh, the north-south interconnector, I mean, if we got a positive um, outcome in terms of the decision, we would envisage that that would be on board by 2025, um, uh, realistically. But we really would need the decision quickly. And again, I mean, we're talking about that doubling of the renewables by 2030. I also see, you know, the, that exploration of uh, an offshore facility as well being. So again, you know, there is time here, and I think again this speaks to the roadmap uh, in terms of timing. But the grid and the, the the reinforcement of the grid is fundamental as well because, and it takes, and beyond the north-south interconnector, because it takes time and it does need 
reinforcement and maybe Alan could speak to that as well, just the, the importance and what we do need to happen on the grid um, in terms of, and this is why the planning reform is fundamental and prompt decision making. Yes, just back on that, just sorry before Alan comes in, just back on that, you know, is there a question of the stability um, of the actual network? And I mean, <laughs> I, I, I took great cognizance of the fact that, that there, there's less stability, I suppose, of the network within the west of the province. Um, this has a real big impact on, on businesses. You know, the last thing any of us want to do is the lights going out um, in any part of the province and we need to make sure that we have security and stability within the net network uh, and uh, looking at the long-term solutions but also very much short-term I think COVID has really brought that into into place you know we need to make sure that that our economy is stable and it has to be every, we have to do everything that we can at a base which is Northern Ireland to make sure that that happens uh, and the All Island, obviously, the All Island Energy Strategy. Sorry, I interrupted you, Al. Maybe I'll just come back on one thing. In terms mm -hmm. of the structure of, of, of the system, we will never jeopardise that. You know, we, we will always operate within our standards of operation. And we gain, we, we, have, uh, we have measures and we have standards that we work to and we over procure to make sure that the, the system is kept stable. Um, I think it's about facilitating growth and mm -hmm. development and not being able to have new industry connect because and we've, we've, we've robust connection policies and we, we really can't make a connection offer to any new industry oh. on the network. So again, that's, that's where the inhibitant comes in that we, we do need to, if we're serious about this, we do need to get on with upgrading our infrastructure and our network. But Alan, do you want to speak in a wee bit more detail about that? Yeah, just uh, thanks, Sinead, for the question. Yeah, uh, like Joe touched on the north-south and how that's critical, and like certainly that is, but also we have in our 10-year network development plan uh, plans in place for the, the west of the province, particularly the northwest, uh, and, and ensuring that the, so the power can flow both out of the west towards the east, but also making sure, and a benefit of doing that, is bringing stability to the, to the west and giving it the capacity that's needed to allow indigenous businesses to grow in that region. Um, if if yourself or any of the other committee are interested, you know we have you know a lot of detail in our 10-year network development plan that, that talks about both the upgrading of existing circuits there towards the west, but also how we can provide new circuits to actually meet the need of the of that region. So again, happy that we could either provide that detail now in a bit more detail, or happy to meet with individuals or the committee again separately to go through those well I'm, I'm happy if you want to take questions from everybody else i know your time is short uh, but i will reconnect with you in relation to that alan is that okay yeah i'd be very happy to Sinead, yeah okay thank you um alan just to pick up on, on that point um do you have an understanding of the scale of investment that would be required to bring the grid up to the level that is able to cope with the, the additional um, renewable uh, capacity. I think our current um, ten-year network investment plan would um, estimate that there is 465 million investment required on the infrastructure over the next ten years. Um, so that's sort of the scale that we're talking of here. Yeah, there's. Of that, of that 465, there's approximately 100 million of that is towards the north-south interconnector. So you can see there that there's a significant amount that would be both part of its, again, part of its for Belfast reinforcement, but also a significant proportion for projects to the to the west and more rural regions of the province. Um, who's next? Um, John Stewart. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, folks, for your presentation. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, John Stewart um, here. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, I represent East Antrim, which I suppose has been the powerhouse of, of Northern Ireland for many years, and we're very proud of that, both Kilroot and Bally Lumford. And I am pleased to see the uh, diversification at Kilroot, just to see that facility continue to go in and the green aspect of that. 
Um, you touched on Sinead's point about uh, the north south interconnector, and you mentioned, I think, Joe, that you're looking at 2025. Could you maybe just outline the timeline and that, what you expect to see along that route? And do you have the support of the, of the minister in terms of, of backing that application? Um, and I'll add in the second point to it, because it is connected. Um, what degree of independence does Sony have from Airgrid? And coupled with that, bearing in mind the integrated single electricity market provision in the protocol, what do you envisage happening in the event of a no-deal scenario? Thank you. Okay, I mean, I think um, I'll, I'll, come, I'll talk first of all to your first point in terms of the north-south and the timelines and ask Alan to speak to that, and then I'll come back to, 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 to your question in relation to Sony and Airgrid and no deal. Alan, do you want to speak to the first one? Yeah, um, thanks, John, for the question. Yeah, uh, I suppose in relation to the north-south, like most of the committee are probably aware, but the, we had positive planning news in January of 2018, and that was rescinded because of, I suppose, more of the decision-making process that was followed at that time. So we at Sony submitted a, a further environmental information addendum in the summer of last year, summer of 2019, and that's currently with the Department for Infrastructure, and they're considering that along with the consultation process that followed our submission of that there. Um, I suppose it's now at a stage where we would be hopeful that the department can make its recommendation to the minister very shortly. Um, and I suppose with those timelines, getting a positive planning decision is important as that then allows those further processes to kickstart in terms of procurement, in terms of securing landowner agreements for access to the land, etc. Um, I suppose we're working on, I suppose we can only assume I suppose, certain timelines and we'd be we would have been hopeful for a decision earlier than we currently have, but we are where we are. So we'd be hopeful for a decision uh, the summer of this year, you know, in the coming weeks or, mo or months, ideally. That would allow the, the, I suppose, the process of handover of the project to NI Networks for the, the construction of the project. So we'd be looking at, there will be a period of procurement that will have to take place, I suppose, because of the I suppose, robust and extended planning process. Uh, all of that procurement, you know, hasn't been able to take place with because of the certainty of when construction could start. So there is an element of procurement. So we'd be looking at construction starting approximately 12 months after we get planning permission, and thereafter we'd be looking at a period of approximately three summers with actual construction of the project. And that would, that's I suppose feeding into our timelines of around about 2024, 2025 before we would be hopeful, hopeful of energization of the project. And you, sorry. Thank you for that. That's very informative. Are you aware, do you have the open support of the Minister for Infrastructure and the Minister for the Economy on this project? I, mean, I think in relation to that is that um, I, I, the, the Minister, this is planning process. It will go to a decision. It, it may well go to the Assembly for a vote, and that, that's where the decisions will be taken in relation to the North South Interconnector, and we, of course, will accept whatever decision comes out. I suppose what we're urging for, and from our perspective, very much see the north-south interconnector and its realisation as being a fundamental part of this. But I, we can't speak to ministerial support in that the minister has to make this decision, and she will have to make this decision with the information put in front of her by her by her departmental officials and colleagues. Um, and, and we're very respectful of the process. Um, just on the second point, then, in terms of the independence from Airgrid and the ISAM. So, in terms of the independence of Airgrid, I mean, normally, whenever you talk about the independence of, of a system operator, Sony, you're talking about independence from generation and supply to make sure that in fulfilling their role, that they, do, they don't have any vested interest in e either the selling of electricity or indeed the adding to the network where you get a return on that investment. And, and therefore, in that context, Sony is very much independent. But your question, and I'm not trying to avoid it at all, is in relation to Sony in the context of the AirGrid group. Um, and as, as the committee maybe is aware, Sony was bought over by AirGrid in 2009 and is part of the AirGrid group. We do work with AirGrid very closely in the context of the single electricity market, um, and that is, and, and have a joint venture with uh, AirGrid in that regard in terms of a single electricity market operator. Uh, that benefits both the consumers in Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, and we do look to avail of any efficiencies and synergies that are within the two organisations. 
increasingly as we move to work um, and trade as effectively as we can in a larger market context, and I'll take the example of the capacity market, which is a Sony, uh, that, that security of supply is a Sony responsibility, but we do seek to get the best deal for consumers in Northern Ireland through a competitive auction process run with AirGrid on an all-island basis to secure the right outcome at minimum cost for consumers. So that's an example of how we work together with AirGrid. Um, in terms of the word independence, or perhaps I would perhaps use the word governance, the utility regulator is looking at the governance of Sony within the AirGrid group. And this is really looking at it in the context as we look forward, this increasing platform of um, uh, you know, an integrated market uh, and a business focus in terms of how we get the best outcomes in realizing the energy transition and in terms of cost for consumers. I, I'm sure also as part of that will be consideration of Brexit considerations of different jurisdictional res uh, responsibilities, et cetera. And, and, and we look forward to the outcome of that governance reviews by the utility regulator and, and don't feel it's appropriate to comment any further in that regard. In terms of a no deal, I mean, we are very, we, we do have the Northern Ireland Protocol, the Northern Ireland Executive, the uh, uh, government and indeed the Irish government are very supportive of continuing with the single electricity market. And that is facilitated within the Northern Ireland Protocol. There are also, um, within that, we, we do have arrangements and, and I fully expect the single electricity market to continue. Um, it is, I mean, climate change is bigger than Brexit and having a fully integrated European, pan-European market is, is very much what we need to aid the delivery of climate change and the Green Deal right across um, Europe, whether we're a member or not. So, so hopefully that, that's addressed some of your questions there, John. Yep, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You don't work with AirGrid, you work for them, don't you? No, I don't, I don't work for I'm the, the managing director of the system operator for Northern Ireland. Sony as a company is owned by Airgrid, um, and we do work together um, in an integrated way to deliver the best outcome for consumers in Northern Ireland. Own you. Well, yes, Airgrid owns the system operator of Northern Ireland. They were sold in 2009 in, a, in an open market, and that, yes, AirGrid bought Sony at that stage. How can we have an, uh, a Northern Ireland energy policy if we don't have an independent system operator for Northern Ireland that will look after Northern Ireland consumer interests? Well, you absolutely do have that in, in Sony, the electricity system operator for Northern Ireland. I'm, I'm sitting here very much focused on a Northern Ireland energy strategy, very much engaged with the department um, in supporting that energy strategy and working in partnership with Northern Ireland Electricity Networks to develop a roadmap that will deliver the optimal solution for Northern Ireland, both informing and shaping policy of the department and subsequently implementing that. So, so I, I would argue very much I'm very focused and, and very clear that my responsibility is in delivering a Northern Ireland energy strategy. And, and where that is beneficial, and I mean, again, this is where energy is going, is that it is really going on into a marketplace and it's really trying to optimize the trading of that electricity right across in as big a, a market as you can get, whether it's into Ireland, across the GB, over to Europe. And that's evidenced by GB even with its current level of integration uh, with, with Europe, is, is trying to very much um, extend that, uh, at least doubling it by 2030. If that was the case in terms of your independence, why then is the utility regulator investigating Sony regarding licensing obligations, governance and independence? I think they're, they're, they're reviewing the governance, and I think that that's a prudent thing to do at this time, given the level of change that is happening in the market um, and the level of integration that is going forward and the interconnection. So I, I think that is up to the utility regulator and you may well want to ask them that question, but I have no issue with that at all. In fact, I think it's an appropriate time to be doing it. 
In terms of the um, submission that Sony made to the utility regulator, did you write that entirely independently, or was our grid part of writing that? I mean, I work with my colleagues. Uh, we work as a single electricity market. I think that if you, if, whenever, whenever you see that response, that the context of a single electricity market is very important in terms of how we work with our grid for the benefit of consumers in the entire Ireland. Um, and therefore, I will have liaised with or my Aerogrid colleagues in putting that in that submission. But I made that submission. You will see my name signed on that submission to the regulator. Well, I don't doubt that, but what I'm trying to establish is the process whereby that submission was produced. Was that, you can see, if there's an investigation taking place uh, by the utility regulator around concerns about Sony's independence, that Aerogrid then have a hand in writing the Sony submission to that uh, to the utility regulator around that inquiry. Can you see why there would be concerns there? And what I'm trying to establish is, while your name went on it, and I don't doubt that, and I don't doubt that you agree with the content of it, because why else would you have signed it? Did Aerogrid write any part of your submission to the utility regulator? I think, Christopher, I, I've, I've commented as far as I am going to comment. I think the regulator is carrying out its review. It's ongoing, and I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment any further on that matter. That's not a no. Um, if Sony is independent, and you're obviously the chief executive, how many of the managers at Sony report directly and solely, solely here is the important word, directly and solely to you? I mean, Christopher, I mean, I don't think I'm here this morning actually to answer these types of questions. I think this morning's discussion is really focused on developing an energy strategy for Northern Ireland. I think what I would say is that within the Airgrid group, we work in a very integrated way across all of our teams, and that is to the benefit of consumers on the island, on the island of Ireland, Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, to maximise the value and uh, to, to, for, for all. But I really don't think that this is an appropriate forum and, and it's meant to be focused in relation to the development of the energy strategy for Northern Ireland, which I think is a, a critical piece of work and a really important one for us to focus on. Well, I absolutely think so too. Um, and that's why it's important that we understand the governance framework in which uh, the development of such a strategy would take place. And that's why um, I, as an elected representative, think that these questions um, are important. Um, Sony has to pay Airgrid for service level agreements. Who works these out and imposes them? And how much do they cost Sony and then ultimately Northern Ireland consumers? We actually don't have service level agreements with Airgrid. Um, we work very much in an integrated way. We do have a cross charging policy between the two organisations. That cross-charging policy is shared with the utility regulator, and it's the utility regulator who approves the funding of Sony via regulatory framework. Um, so that's how that operates, Christopher. Just one final question, Chair, and I appreciate you've been very indulgent with me. Um, one uh, final question. Uh, Airgrid reported in their annual report in 2019 that the group delivered a €4 million Euro dividend to the Exchequer in the Republic of Ireland. Could you outline to me what some of that dividend originated from Northern Ireland bill payers and taxpayers, including what monies were given through Sony paying Airgrid, and how this is itemised showing accountability value for money and the exact services that were actually paid for? Well, you know, as I say, we don't actually pay for services. There's a cross-charging policy. In the context of the dividend, I mean, Sony has never paid a dividend to Airgrid since it was purchased in 2009, and that can be evidenced by a review of Sony's statutory accounts in which it is a legal requirement to state any dividends that are paid. Um, so I, I think that, that, that perhaps answers your question. Okay. Thank you, Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much. Um, just leading on from what Christopher has said, do, do you recognise, Joe, perhaps that there is a conflict of interest and that the Northern Ireland consumer is not 
getting the best value for money in relation to electricity supply? No, I, I actually, I'm not sure I would agree with that, actually. I mean, I do think that the Northern Ireland consumer is a great beneficiary of the all island market and of working uh, with the air grid in fulfilling the same duties. In, in, in the Southern Ireland. And in fact, you would find that throughout Europe, the relationship and the working together of system operators is a fundamental in terms of getting the right answer going forward for a green economy. Um, and so there is a network of transmission system, an NCOE body that works in Europe and that liaises and works very closely together to try and make sure that we optimize the system because that's what it's all about. That's what all of the increased level of integration between all of the all of the markets and everything else is, is about, is making sure that we optimize that renewable energy for everybody, for all of consumers to drive down costs. Um, so I, I think what is important in the context of the Northern Ireland strategy, because we are a small, small Northern Ireland, is that we make sure that we get what's our roadmap right for us and our timing right for us. And I think that's where I fit in and that's where Soli fits in and very much working with Northern Ireland Electricity Networks and very much working with the department um, as we are doing through the thematic groups, which we're grateful to see and in, in engaging with all industries um, in Northern Ireland. I think that's crucial as well. There is that perception of there is a risk the conflict of interest risk. How, how do you manage that risk? I, I just don't perceive that I do have a conflict of interest. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very focused on delivering the right outcome for consumers in Northern Ireland. And if that, and I believe it is, is trying to get access to larger markets, trying to get them as efficiently delivered as possible, then, then that's what I will do. Um, and that is very much my focus. I do understand, well, maybe perhaps understand is the wrong word, but I do accept that uh, there are concerns or perceptions of concern around Sony, its independence, how it operates, etc. And that's why I'm, I'm very welcoming of the utility regulators' review of governance of Sony within the air grid group. And, and I, I look forward to the finalization of um, the outcome of that, which hopefully will address some of these concerns. Are you open to encouraging your, your organisation to work with the utility regulator to address those issues? Well, yeah, absolutely. We fully cooperate with the utility regulator in the context of its governance and indeed in any context. Um, yes, absolutely. Okay. Moving on, the North South um, interconnector has been on the agenda a long time, around, certainly around this assembly. Do you still see it as vital for the future of um, the management of energy throughout, uh, not just Northern Ireland, but through the Republic of Ireland? Do you think it is paramount, the paramount importance that we should continue to push for it? it? It's actually really important for the consumers in Northern Ireland, because without it, we are just very small and islanded and we, we won't attract any investment because investors won't want to come if they don't have access to larger markets. Um, it's already costing consumers £20 million per annum. If we continue to put more renewables on the system, that is likely to double over the next decade. Um, and really, you know, we, if we keep putting more renewables on a very constrained system, we just won't get the value. You know, again, investors will not want to come because we're already having to curtail some of the renewables down um, because there's too much of them on the system at, a, at the moment because of the constraints in the system. And we need to remove those constraints so we truly have access to that larger market. Okay, just on, on the grid then and the whole issue of of the weaknesses of the grid, um, and we are aware that their, their energy suppliers, small energy suppliers, wind turbines are being switched off, for example, uh, because they're unable to uh, feed into the system because of the weaknesses. How do you see that 
issue of uh, upgrading the grid being funded as we move forward. I know in the Republic they've used different systems perhaps to what we have used here in Northern Ireland. What, what are your thoughts on how we, we fund the upgrade of the grid moving forward? I mean, the, the, the upgrading of the grid is really approved because the utility regulator oversees our planning and oversees Northern Ireland electricity as well. And therefore, the development of the grid is funded through your bills, really. Um, I mean, 25, I mentioned earlier, about 65% of consumers' bills is made up of the wholesale energy costs. About 25% is made up of the network cost, and that cost is seen in your bills. So it's the utility regulator that oversees the, the network, the planning that we do that's, and, and scrutinizes that we are right in terms of the need for it, et cetera. And then they remunerate Northern Ireland electricity in terms of the construction of it. I think what needs to happen, though, is, is about the deliverability of this in a time frame that, that, that gives us, us our outcomes and allows us to meet our targets. And in that context, I think that's where we need to look at the planning process in terms of timelines for decision making, and also look at the communities affected by the infrastructure and start to think about how we can remunerate those communities that are affected and how we can get them to better understand and support our move towards um, a net zero um, world and improve the address climate change for, for their benefits, for their children's benefits, and et cetera. I think that's where perhaps we need to need to put the focus in. Okay, thanks very much, everyone, for your contribution. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. On Odard. John. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, partially, I'm slightly surprised that Christopher's uh, concerns around our grid, Sony, and the free market, because Christopher's uh, an avid free marketeer, a capitalist, uh, and supports the market driving the economy. So if those are the deepest pockets by companies, then that's how that system works. So if Christopher wants to join me on a crusade of nationalization, uh, I, I think we could have make great progress in regards and ensure everybody's accountability around how our utilities are delivered. So I look forward to myself and Christopher spearheading that campaign going into the future. Uh, but my question is that uh, I gave we come up with a, a presentation to the economy committee from uh, investors or utility company or uh, providers of services to our society. And, and we hear uh, the Belfast centric um, emphasis. Uh, I understand that Belfast is a, is a major economic driver. <coughs> But unless we start looking at investing uh, in a regionally balanced way in terms of our utilities, then Belfast is always going to be um, the, the center to, to a certain degree. But it's also going, going to contribute to the congestion, the travel difficulties, and all those other things that are associated with uh, targeting all your industry and commerce or the, the driver for that industry and commerce in the one place. How can you assure us that uh, you're concentrating or, or ensuring that your investment is regionally balanced? I mean, I'm going to let Alan come in briefly on this, but what I would say is it's the west of the province that is really providing the richness of the indigenous um, onshore wind that we really want to access. And actually, our 10-year network development plan is quite focused on reinforcing the grid, particularly in the West, to better facilitate that. Alan, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yes, John. I, I didn't I suppose, go into all the detail of the projects that we are considering for the, the West and the, the, the Southwest of the province. We have a project to I suppose, provide additional you know, capacity and security of supply into the uh, Armagh region as well, which would really, I suppose, you know, really improve the security of supply in that region. It's already a significant contributor in terms of so industry and uh, jobs in that area. Uh, we also have a, a, you know, a huge amount of work. It's all detailed out in our 10-year transmission development plan in terms of 
best in the, the County Tyrone area, out even into Donegal and uh, in, the, in, I suppose, the, the County London Dairy, Dairy uh, area as well. So we, we have significant investment proposals there, um, totaling, I, I would I suppose, estimate over 300 million. Uh, so there is a significant uh, investment plan, and it's something that, that our team of investment planners here at Sony look at. You know, when they look at the, the grids, they look at where the pinch points are across all of Northern Ireland, and it's not just the east. Uh, I can assure you of that there. And again, as, as I mentioned to Sinead, we'd be more than happy to come out and talk to you about our plans that we have for, you know, for the, the rural parts of, of Northern Ireland as well. Very much happy to do that. Oh, okay, and at some stage I'll take this up on that offer. But the concerns, particularly in rural communities, uh, where they have the, the, the infrastructure, the, the large wind turbine farms, or uh, the concerns around the, the, the connector, uh, rural communities end up with the infrastructure, and the view is that little of the investment, and they don't benefit from that investment. So th th there, there is the rub for me in the sense of, uh, if you have large infrastructure running through your your, your rural community, and you don't see the benefits of that. And that's not just obviously a, a comment for Sony. It, it, it's how you develop a regionally balanced economy. Uh, I, I, I think rural communities have a defensible position and say, we, we put up with all the infrastructure, we don't get the benefits from it. And, and I think, Joan, that, that's where, in, in terms of the development of the Northern Ireland um, energy strategy, we'd be very strong supporters of. of uh, more proactive move towards community funding and community schemes that help communities benefit from the disruption uh, that comes from this infrastructure. Um, and other regions have those schemes in place, and it would greatly aid us and, and, and rightly benefit the communities if, if such schemes were put in place, and hopefully they'll be contemplated as part of this strategy. Okay. Well, when me and Mr. Stalford nationalise utility services, we'll talk about it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Gary? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, and thanks to, to Joe and for the, uh, the presentation. Uh, obviously, uh, Joe, you will have heard from, from members around the, the concerns uh, regarding, uh, regarding Sony and the, the investigation by utility regulator. And I do appreciate that you have said that you understand or certainly um, you, you, you hear those concerns. And I think that as a committee, uh, while well, it's our first time to, to hear from you um, uh, during this mandate, I think that you know, for all of us, it is about uh, keeping a watch and brief on uh, those findings and how we go forward. But I appreciate that's a matter now uh, for the utility, utility regulator. Uh, I, I did want to bring forward uh, some concerns. Uh, over the past number of weeks, I've been speaking to many within the energy sector, suppliers and developers, uh, and they have raised with me one common thread, and it's around you know, the lengthy processes that exist uh, within Sony. And I appreciate that some of those are outside of your control, and we've really touched on you know, planning issues. But if we were to meet the energy targets and if we were to deliver on an energy strategy, uh, what, what are you doing within uh, Sony to try and streamline the processes and ensuring that you know, people can uh, get delivery on a much quicker basis than what they currently are? Uh, and Gary, I think that's, that's an appropriate question to be asking. And I think as part of our strategy, we are looking at how we structure ourselves. We are looking at what takes too long for us to process through and are looking at and um, scrutinizing and challenging ourselves in terms of our, our access planning, in terms of our future looking planning, in terms of our exploring of what options are the right options, um, in terms of even working with NIE networks. So I'll let Alan maybe pick up on this as well, but, but I, I have no problem with your question. And I think it is one that we are asking ourselves in terms of what are our timelines? How can we do this better ourselves? To, to reduce our internal timelines in terms of processing through the connection um, process for, for, for individuals and indeed our planning of, of, of infrastructure. I suppose, Gary, just, yeah, I suppose there's, there's a significant portion of time and it depends the complexity of each individual project and the connection, but we do aim for best practice, particularly when it comes to involving the community in our decision making. Uh, we, we recently received a positive planning for a, a, a wind farm.
farm or cluster of wind farm connections up in a Givy in Korean. And at that planning committee, um, this was the consultation that we carried out was recognized as being best in class. And that's quite a new process that we've put in place to make sure that the, the community that's hosting the infrastructures brought along in the journey and in our decision making. So that we, you know, we totally want to respect the involvement of communities uh, in our decision making and you know what we're doing from an environmental perspective. So that, I mean, that does come with uh, the, the burden of some additional time that, that is spent, but it is recognised as being, I suppose, you know, a good industry practice uh, and certainly up there with with the best across uh, other parts of the of Europe. Um, we we do also talk about, I suppose, that you know, in our response to the energy strategy consultation, just about the need for for planning reform, and that's not to to disservice the, the you know the, the people that work in making the decisions or analysing the you know the, the important information we provide and the, the consultation that's carried out, but it's really just streamlining the decision making process as well that we get we, you know we, we get a, a positive um, decision in a timely manner. I suppose is is really what we ask. Yeah. No, look, thanks for that. It is something that, again, we just urge you to please uh, try and prioritise that in terms of that streamlining. I know that there, there's frustration out there. Some of them um, genuine, as I say, some of them uh, should be quite easily fixed. But I suppose just to move on to the final uh, question, and it's around uh, interconnection. We, we we're talking about uh, the North South uh, interconnector. Uh, but in terms of interconnection with GB, I know that there's a lot of um, there's businesses out there, uh, some of whom uh, colleagues have spoken to uh, around that interconnection with GB. And as we, we move forward, and uh, even out of the um, out of this COVID-19 crisis and the new uh, Brexit world and all of that, you know, what has been done to improve that connection? I mean, I think, I don't know whether, Gary, you're talking about the Moil interconnector. I mean, currently, we have the Moil interconnector with Scotland, and there is a limitation on the export capacity. And believe you me, I, I've been pushing for some time that this is an area that we need to remedy, and it's all about the, the limitation on the grid in Scotland, uh, because they have done a lot of wind development and renewable development themselves, and therefore the capacity doesn't exist. But uh, pushing very much uh, the utility regulator and off-gem, because of course it's off-gem the regulator for the GB market, that, that dictates the um, reinforcement of, the, of their network to be saying that really, as a principle, flows across interconnectors should be allowed to flow freely to maximise the value of all of the renewables on the system. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, it is an area in looking at the strategy and looking at development, that again, we do need to keep pushing for that um, maximization of flows uh, across the interconnectors, and, that, and the mobile interconnector is very much one of them. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chair. And obviously, in the interest of time, uh, I, I do have other points, but uh, I, I think that it is important that we do schedule uh, in the future uh, another engagement where we can, we can have this discussion and maybe uh, as I say, just allocate maybe a bit more time as well to that. But thanks. Thank you um, very much, um, Joe, and and your your colleagues as well. Just to to say, I suppose um, Alan, I think mentioned the the Gibby project there and the consultation that went on around it. Um, and that, that's my own constituency, and it, and it was an extensive consultation um, process that went on. And I, I think that as a model, that um, engagement with the community is really really important. Um, and it was something that I certainly found a, um, a positive in terms of the, the way it was done. Um, and just, I wanted to pick up, um, Joe, you said, I think there in relation to the North-South interconnector that that would go to a vote in the Assembly. I don't think that's the case. It would mm -hmm. be decided by the Minister and right. potentially by the Executive, but it's very much a matter for the Minister. Okay, thank you very much for that, for that, for that clarification. Um, um, I would just encourage every everybody or anybody who can support it if you agree with it of course that, that that would be very helpful to get to get that um get that approval if if, if that's the minister's decision. Thank you for your, your information this morning. It was really useful. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it and, and I'd just be very happy to come back at any time and as Alan said to meet any individual members of the committee 
uh, if, if that's helpful or informative for you, we're, we're open to that at any stage. So thank you very much. Thank you, and I'm sure we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, now. Okay, um, so moving on then to item number five, there is our departmental briefing um, on the energy strategy, um, and I think everybody's on the line. There should be. We heard enough clicks, Chair. Oh. Yeah. Kayla, Richard. I Richard. Chair from the department, and along with Thomas Byrne and Maeve Cormigan. Hey, Kayla, Thomas Byrne here. Hi there. Hi, Emma. Um, okay, so there is um, a number of items here in um, your PACS members, as I'll just refer you to them. There is um, a participant's response to the RHI consultation at page 38, a departmental briefing paper providing an update on the development of the energy strategy at page 3 of the table papers, a response from the Finance Minister to the committee's micro-inquiry on the energy strategy at page 6 of the table papers. Um, Richard, if I hand over to you, and if you just want to give it a bit of an opening statement, and then we'll open it up. Thanks, uh, Kira. I, I was going to turn immediately to the substance of the session, which is an update on the work on the energy strategy um, in the context of your micro-inquiry into to be able to support the development of the energy strategy. And I was going to turn immediately to Thomas, who heads up the development of the energy strategy in the department. Thanks, Richard. Um, so, so we're here today to provide an update on the development of a new energy strategy following the briefing we provided on the 11th of March. So we'll focus on development since then. Obviously, the world's a very different place now to when we were last in front of you. Um, I think it's important to say that the development of a new energy strategy remains a high priority for the department. and Work has continued to progress at pace over the past few months. Indeed, we, we've watched and monitored the impacts on energy from the current situation. So we've seen energy demand having fallen significantly over the past couple of months. And indeed, the times of day that we use our energy is also different. We've seen the prices of fossil fuels, such as gas and oil, having plummeted during this time. And we've also seen fewer vehicles on the road uh, and fewer emissions from these. So we'll have to consider whether any of these changes will be long-lasting and how the move back towards normal society um, will impact on these. So we're going to cover three broad topics today in our briefing. Um, the first of these will be on the call for evidence and just an update on where we are with it. The second on further evidence gathering. And then finally, we'll talk a bit about collaboration and communication. So on the call for evidence, I mean, the call for evidence was initially, originally scheduled to close on the 20th of March. Uh, and obviously, that was very much um, around the time that COVID was hitting and the lockdown was about to start. So it did impact on the timing of respondents to, to respond to that original deadline. So we extended it by two weeks. We tried certainly to be as flexible as possible with respondents to allow them to, to get a response in. So it has now closed and we have a total of 161 responses to the call for evidence having been received. These responses have, been, have come from a very diverse range of stakeholders and all provided um, very different perspectives on the future of energy strategy. So the core of the work beyond the call for evidence is being taken forward by five working groups across heat, power, transport, consumers, and energy efficiency. So all five groups have now been established and are working their way through the responses to analyze the evidence submitted, and then start to identify what the key themes and the key issues are arising from these, highlight where we may still have evidence gaps, gather further evidence, uh, and ultimately produce options for consideration. So the department intends to publish a summary report of all of the responses received along with each individual response, with all personal information redacted later this month. Um, it'll also be accompanied by a report on the five workshops that took place back in February um, to, to give a bit of a readout on the key themes that were discussed at the workshops. So the summary report from, from the call for evidence will be shared with the committee before we publish it. I'll talk a little bit about further evidence gathering, because that's really the focus of, of what we're doing at the moment. Um, I mean, the next phase of the energy strategy development very much is about evidence, and significant progress has been made on this in, in recent months. I'll cover a few broad points of interest. Um, I think, first of all, we're working with a Dutch company called Quintel to develop an energy transition model for Northern Ireland. So this will be an open source model. Um, it'll be published on the internet, and it'll be freely available to use. So the model is going to capture the energy that we use, what we use it for, how efficiently we use it, and the emissions that result from this. It's going to allow us to test the impact of potential options coming forward through the strategy. Um, it's also going to allow external stakeholders 
to develop their own scenarios around heat power transport and energy efficiency to inform the discussion. And we expect the model to be available in uh, autumn 2020. So alongside the modeling work, we've, we've funded three research think pieces to date. We're asking many energy academics to provide a bit of a synopsis on existing literature and research on some strategic energy issues and draw out some of the key implications for the energy strategy. So we funded three to date. The first of those is looking very much at energy governance and how we're set up here compared with elsewhere. Um, that's the University of Exeter taking that forward. The second is on mapping a just energy transition. So that'll be looking at the economic opportunities and changes that will arise as a result of the transition and some of the impacts on society and on people and on skills. That's Queen's. And then finally, around demand side flexibility and smart meters, and that's Ulster University. So we have a further five research think pieces currently in, in development, and we're looking for uh, invitations from the academic research community to take these forward, looking at issues such as finance, uh, funding innovation, the energy research base, hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. We have a further three research projects we're looking to take forward as well alongside these to look back at the strategic energy framework and uh, what's happening on energy strategy elsewhere. We want to look at the business and industrial sector and the energy they use and how we can decarbonize that. Um, and also look at organizations focused on sustainable energy that exist in other jurisdictions and lessons from these. So again, we're very, very happy to keep the committee updated on progress uh, and for future briefings on, on the evidence we gather and the research that we that we gather. And certainly before anything's published, again, very happy to share this with the committee prior to that. So the final thing to talk around is collaboration and communication. And I think perhaps Maeve, if you fancy saying a few words, that'd be helpful. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, everyone. Um, so obviously, since we've met the 11th of, we last met the 11th of March, we've we've had the chance to see the call for evidence close, and also then uh, have a look at just the engagement that we had through the call for evidence process, and how that panned out in terms of responses received to the call for evidence, and also a little bit of forward planning for the next phase. So we started with. Thomas has already mentioned there were workshops across Northern Ireland. We had a social media presence through the call for evidence period. We had a significant number of direct meetings um, with environmental, consumer, business, uh, energy groups, etc. through that period, about 26 um, presentations, conferences, meetings, etc. And, of course, the ongoing in internal engagement through the, the project board and our government stakeholder group. So we looked at all of that engagement uh, the way that we had managed to reach out, and we were we were pleased with the responses that we got to the call for evidence. So there were 161 responses across a really wide range of of interest areas, and not just that. When we started the call for evidence process, uh, we had a within the department we had about 158 stakeholders on our engagement list. And by the time we got to the end, through the workshops, through the external engagement and the call for evidence process, we had uh, 305 stakeholders identified that had participated or engaged or been part in some way of, of kind of in involvement in the energy strategy at that stage. So we, we're, we're pleased with that significant increase in terms of the, the number of people that we've managed to engage with. And a really key, a crucial question for us has now been, how do we continue that engagement and how do we ensure that all of those wide variety of stakeholders are kept informed as we go on because we didn't want to get to a place where we close the call for evidence and then and then didn't communicate out. So we have developed a, a, a draft communication plan. We have uh, so segmented the stakeholders, those that will be very heavily involved um, through things like the project board or our thematic working groups that Thomas has mentioned, um, right then down to, I suppose, the general public. And part of that is identifying where we have been very successful at reaching new types of stakeholders that are that are of relevance and also looking at those areas where we where we maybe need to make a little bit more of an effort so we can identify perhaps channels of communication where we can reach out over the course of the coming months to ensure that people, whether individuals or organisations or maybe it's a thematic or geographical areas, are all able to access the information um, that, that is available in terms of the energy strategy. So we, as I say, there is a communications plan one of the concrete actions that we're taking is to is to produce a, a, a bulletin, and it's a bulletin that will be emailed out to all stakeholders that are have expressed an interest. People can sign up via the website, uh, and we'll also publish these on the website. So these will give us 
as a department the opportunity to continue to involve people and let them know of the progress as we as we go along. Um, and I think it's just worth noting here that when we talk about the energy strategy, it's a 30-year period. It's a very long time frame. And at this point in time, we recognise that it will mean significant changes to aspects of people's lives. And so we want to make sure that people are able to understand um, and be involved with those as much as possible. So as Thomas has said, there is a there is a, a, a summary report coming out, call for evidence summary report, regular monthly uh, bulletins. And we'll also have, a, uh, we have a fuller communications plan to ensure that we're, we're engaging with people, whether it be internally, uh, whether it's consumer-based uh, businesses, whether it's with officials, relevant officials and other departments outside of Northern Ireland. Um, the, full, the full stakeholder list is there, so we'll be happy to, to share that as well. Just to finish, Thanks. Chair, um, just to finish, Chair, the, the, you, you know, you can, what you've heard, there is a substantial work program underway. People ask us, you know, why, why is it taking so long? This is a, the whole area of energy is, is complex and especially in the shift to decarbonizing the, the energy mix across power, heat and, and transport. So, um, the, the mountain of work that's being done is to, and, and the stakeholder engagement, I mean, 305 people formally engaging in the process already. Um, the intention is to have this options on the way forward out by, by March, which is really not that far away, uh, considering how time, fast time is flying by now. Um, and we want, to be, we want there to be no surprises in those options. And as May have said, you know, whilst it's a 30-year look forward to net zero carbon. There are things that need to be done now. There are things that need to be done in the next five years. This will be a living, breathing strategy that will be continually monitoring. It's the start of a process um, and it builds on, on the successes and learns from the failures of the, of the past. So um, I hope that, that, that that's helpful. Certainly, we, we welcome the, um, your, your own inquiry and look forward to receiving the, the output of that to feed into the work that we're doing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I guess just to pick up on, on some of, of those points, um, and Thomas, you mentioned like uh, and and the the reduction, I suppose, in energy um, use over the course of, of the lockdown. I assume we expect that to return to some um, level that it was before, if not fully to the level. You know, if people do um, choose to continue to adopt the the new ways of working, I suppose that we have. It. Um, had in place over over recent weeks, but I assume that it would return to some similar level. Yeah, I mean, I suppose we have to see how it pans out. Um, I guess a couple of things that that we want to factor in is the change to how businesses operate. So I think probably what the lockdown has showed is that um, businesses business businesses can function in the same way that they did before, but they don't necessarily need to be in the office in the same way. So I think probably what this change will bring around is for businesses to look at how they operate, um, and that will have an impact on energy use in offices and in homes. Um, so I think that's one key area that we'll look at and see whether that goes back to normal or whether there's a bit of a difference uh, than what we see at the, at the moment. I think also travel as well. Um, this has obviously had a big impact on travel and public transport and, and things like that. So both of those are things that we'll look at through the energy strategy and we'll monitor and see uh, see how they change over time. And I think if I, if I come in there as well, I mean, I think what the last two months has given us is a glimpse of how things might look whenever we talk about net zero carbon. I mean, it's, it, it, it will, as you suggest, that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll revert to where we were with, with, you know, with the exception of some of the things Thomas mentioned there. But, you know, for example, on travel, I mean, the modal shift, getting people out of cars and onto public transport can have a dramatic impact on our environment. It's not just about carbon emissions, it's also about air quality. And it's great, for example, that our working group is being led by the Department for Infrastructure. So this is how we are properly joining up government, if you like, that it's all parts of government feeding into what is a government-wide energy strategy. Um, obviously, we're talking about the energy strategy. But um, I, the significant changes in terms of what will be required to meet net zero um, is going to have significant economic impacts as well. Um, and just in terms of the, the economic recovery in light of the, um, the pandemic, um, 
what kind of work is being done in relation to the energy strategy fitting into the, the broader recovery strategy? Is, is that work um, taking place at the minute? Thomas, do you want to come back on that or want me to take it? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. I mean, I suppose the department's working very much um, at, at different phases, I suppose, in terms of economic recovery. And the first has been very much about addressing some of the hardship and some of the issues that have been felt in the short term. But I think the attention is gradually now starting to turn to, to the medium, the longer term, and the recovery and how we do that. Um, and I think there's a very broad acceptance that, that it needs to be a green recovery, and we need to help to support um, uh, climate change uh, 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 and net zero through that. And I would say the energy strategy does provide a vehicle for that as well. Um, I think one of the things we need to look at in the energy strategy, and we will be looking at, isn't just decarbonisation. It's how we can provide economic opportunities as a result from that. So I think one thing we can say across the board as we look at some of the issues within energy strategy is how, how much innovation is required and how much that can provide a stimulus for the economy. Um, so, I mean, I'd fully agree that, that when we look to the economic recovery, that green energy, green growth has to be a key part of that. Um, and that's something that we'll be considering uh, through the energy strategy as well. And one of the, one of the opportunities that, that in addition to that is that we're talking about the just transition. And this really means that energy should be affordable for everybody in society. And it should be, it should be providing a competitive price for business to compete on what, on what is a global market. And I think the, the move from the volatility of fossil fuels, where we've seen, you know, we've seen oil um, you know, locally traded below $20 a barrel, now back towards uh, $30 a barrel. Um, it's very volatile. Um, and renewable energy tends to be more stably priced. And that, in turn, can help us tackle fuel poverty. Like what, one of the things I proposed, or we proposed as a party, is a just transition commission to bring um, like social stakeholders together in terms of that, and alongside business, energy, um, you know, right across society. In terms of the responses to your um, initial call for evidence, um, you know, you mentioned the diversity. Uh, like, what level of diversity are we kind of talking about there in terms of those responses? So I'm happy to, to take that one. Um, so we were able to talk to a lot of, obviously, the energy sector, and I suppose um, the, the energy sector that, that we, we might have been speaking with more would have been the, the maybe electricity, gas sectors to an extent. But in terms of how we were able to spread that beyond, we were speaking to the, the building construction sectors as well, and we got responses from those architects, for example. So we're, those are sectors which are looking specifically at buildings, at insulation, at, at kind of issues within buildings uh, that affect fuel poverty, energy efficiency, etc. Um, and I'd say overall, the energy sector, if you include all of the, um, the, the energy for heat, energy for transport, energy for power, that was about 42% of our responses. But that, that again, I suppose, covers a, a, a very diverse group of companies and businesses within that. Um, there were a significant number of academic and consultancy responses, so about 18%. So they might have ranged from responses from a really good response, interestingly, from uh, some of the the MS or the, the master's students at Queen's who actually did specific research to submit to the energy strategy, which was really, really welcome. Um, so from individual pieces of research by students right the way up to kind of academic reports that had been previously written and were submitted, uh, you know, in response to the call um, and specific p pieces of consultancy that had been maybe carried out for certain sectors and again were sent through as they would have been of interest. Consumer groups and citizen representative bodies, so consumers range from, I suppose, representatives of domestic consumers to, to maybe the manufacturers, were about 11%, and again, they, they covered quite a broad range. Um, and interestingly as well, we had um, about 18% of the responses were from individuals, uh, and I think that's a that's something that we, we, we'll be looking at and saying, well, what kind of individuals were engaged? It's, it's very positive that people actually took the time um, as, a, as an individual rather than a company or a business or organisation to respond in. And it'll be interesting to see what the, what the key topics were for those individuals. And, of course, we also had responses from uh, central government 
and from local governments. So the, the call for evidence itself was developed with input from a number of government departments. I mean, specifically, I suppose, to note DERA on the decarbonisation um, Department for Communities on Fuel Poverty and Energy Efficiency, uh, Infrastructure on Transport um, and Finance on Building Regulations. So there was a lot of work in, that had gone into the document with other government departments even before it went into the public domain. But we did get uh, government responses and quite a good response from local government as well, from local councils. And we've, we've kept that engagement up uh, since the call for evidence closed. And we, we're continuing to engage with both local and uh, and with other government departments. Positive, I think it's really positive that 18% of the responses came from individuals who were motivated enough to, um, to actually submit something. And I think that's something to be really welcomed, that this is really a topic that reaches out to people that they want to participate in. So I think that's something to be really encouraged in the future. Um, John Stewart. No, nope. thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, folks, for your presentation so far. I mean, clearly there's a massive amount of work to be done, and you are doing a great job. There's a lot to collate, especially after the hiatus of the last three years and putting that all together now. So I commend you for the work to date and look forward to seeing the outcomes of that. Um, there's so much detail um, and so much has been fed back through the consultation process. Um, one aspect um, I've been lobbied on from constituents um, is on behalf of cooperatives in terms of wind energy cooperatives and social enterprises and those who wish to play their part in the green energy strategy going forward, um, but maybe have found it difficult to get established and to feed into that. Did you get much consultation on that? And do you see a place for the likes of Drumlin Wind Energy Co-op and others to be able to play a role in our energy strategy going forward? Um, again, uh, Thomas, Richard, I'm, I'm happy to take that one if you want to jump in after. Um, maybe you pick up a bit about Drumlin Cooperatives and then Thomas could you give us a view of the wider um, community energy sort of the wind side of things. Yeah, uh, so in terms of the, the, uh, the, the community cooperatives, we had two specific questions around this in the call for evidence. And one was around, you know, examples of existing cooperatives um, in Northern Ireland. And then others were around how, whether there were examples in other parts of the UK and Ireland or even further afield um, of good community energy projects. And, and the role, I suppose, a supplementary question there, the role of government to facilitate that. So we did get a lot of uh, responses give in terms of the you know giving specific examples of, of local projects. So they included the Drumlin Cooperative, um, the Northern Ireland Co Energy Cooperative Association. Um, so we did have the we did have specific examples in Northern Ireland. I suppose it's fair to say that there weren't as many as you would see in other parts of the UK, and that leads on to the the second question that was around what is the role of government because an awful lot of people uh, pointed to examples in both Scotland and in the Republic of Ireland in terms of what the approach has been there to encourage uh, higher levels of uh, energy communities or citizen energy communities, slightly different, I suppose, terminology for some of those. Uh, but Scotland has a very well resourced, uh, both a local and a national level uh, degree of support for encouraging uh, community energy projects. And the Republic of Ireland has a different structure, but again, it, it, it and maybe not so long established, but it is now quite well established um, as support scheme. So there was reference to what Northern Ireland had done but also reference to maybe lessons that could be learned from, from other from other parts of the UK and Ireland in terms of how to continue to do that or, or, or develop it if that were if that were something that were considered valuable. Yeah, thank you. I mean Scotland I think has set a good standard in this and obviously taking any best practice model, you take the best bits and we learn from the difficulties they've had. And I think if we can maybe feed that into it it would be very worthwhile. But thank you, thanks folks and keep up the good work. Thank you. Um Sinead? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. okay. Thank you, Thomas, Richard, Maeve, um, for, for the update. Um, I suppose one of the things that I would like to say is this pandemic, I think, has brought, um, brought to the fore just how vulnerable society is uh, to a virus. And it's certainly the first time in my generation that I have witnessed a global uh, pandemic or anything near this level and you know it has really focused my mind as well like never before about climate change and the damage that it can do and it's not something that happens elsewhere you know something that happens elsewhere actually affects us here 
So uh, and I think that's probably nearly why you've got so much engagement from individuals because climate change is at the top of people's agenda and, and, and all of the data and all of the briefings that we've been taken from, from various bodies um, throughout uh, the last or uh, nine weeks, um, everybody is talking about recovery using a uh, Green New Deal as a platform and a mechanism to do it. And I really appreciate the work that you have been doing in relation to the energy strategy. Uh, and I, I understand totally um, how complex it is and how evolving it is. Uh, and the fact that um, you have actually been working on this while um, the, the, the administrations, et cetera, were down. However, I think this needs to be really speed up. And even if it's not in, in the totality, all our ducks are in the right place. We really, really need to be working towards targets and the publishing of the energy strategy. Have you got a definitive timeline when we're going to have that energy strategy? Strategy, even in draft format or even in part format, as I'm saying, um, because I think that we really need to start unlocking our economy around that long-term strategy and outlook. I'll, I'll start very quickly and I'll turn to Thomas just to say that we are not, you know, in terms of unlocking the economy and the opportunities that come from green energy and clean mm -hmm. energy and green growth, we're not waiting for the strategy to land because the strategy is just the next step along the way of the existing strategy, if you like, which is about we've got a wide, wide, wide proliferation of wind and, and solar now. So look, we won't let uh, the, the, the publication of targets um, come out of the strategy, stop doing what we need to do now. Um, however, it is, the, it is a, the thorny issue of what type of support can be provided in the short and medium term to facilitate the delivery of decarbonisation. And we've got to get that right, because when we get it right, it's great, like NARA, when we get it wrong, like RHI, it's not so great. So, Thomas, do you want to talk about the, the rationale behind the, the timetable, maybe? Sure, yes, of course. I mean, the, the timetable for the broad energy strategy is really, I suppose, the rest of this year, doing much of the evidence gathering and the work to come up with options, and then putting those out for consultation uh, in March 2021, with a view of having a, an energy strategy published uh, later that year. Um, but I think the point Richard put forward is a really important one, that... We're moving forward the energy strategy, but the issues within it don't stop. And I think what we're trying to do is look at opportunities to take forward action um, and to take forward, uh, take advantage of some of the opportunities we have um, in sort of the, the short term on this front. Um, so, you know, the energy strategy, hopefully the timelines are clear enough, but I, I don't want you to think that that's stopping other work taking place that needs to happen now. That's great. Thank you very much for that. Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much, everyone, for your contribution. Those number of the points have been covered. Um, the cost of energy, obviously, is a big uh, challenge, and as, you know, as we try to rebuild the economy, especially for manufacturers, I think and I was became somewhat discouraged there as we were told the oil prices are starting to increase again. I was uh, thinking that we're going to gain substantially by the, the decrease. What about the encouragement of gas and, and trying to bring it forward? How do you feel that fits in within the strategy? That's the first point. The second one is what we know on earlier is about the interconnector. Uh, obviously, it's very significant for the long-term plans and the strategy of energy in Northern Ireland. How do you see that um, importance of that? Is it still as important as it has been over the last 10 years, or maybe it hasn't been that important because it's, it's been sitting there for so long, but it is complex, and we all know the processes are extremely complex, but we, we want to see that brought to a conclusion. And the other point I would have is in smart metering, something that has been talked about for a number of years. Do you feel that we would get to a point where the domestic consumer would have access to smart metering? And if it was, I think there would be many advantages on how consumers would use their energy. If I quickly make a comment, uh, Gordon, on the interconnector, then I'll turn to Thomas for uh, the conversation about you know, what, what we're doing about gas at the moment and, and smart metering. Um, it's, the, the answer, on, uh, I listened to the end of the, the conversation you had with, uh, with Sony there before this particular part of the meeting, and, you know, the department has has agreed there is a need for uh, interconnection, the, the north-south interconnector. Uh, it's been around for, let's call it 15 years, it might even be longer. 
And as you say, the longer we go on without it, you kind of might think, is it really that important? It is really important. I, I heard Joe Austin say it's costing consumers £20 million pounds a year today, and, and that may even be an underestimate. What is clear is that when you have interconnection, it provides a resilience in the system and it provides access to lower cost electricity. And we've supported the interconnector and the interconnector. Hopefully, in the upcoming weeks rather than months, we'll maybe get some news coming out of the Department of the Infrastructure on the, on, the, on the planning decision. So, yes, um, we, we, we would welcome the decision on the interconnector and certainly um, look forward to that coming forward. Uh, over to you, Thomas, on the issue about you know, what, what we're doing about gas. Thanks, Richard. So, so the issue around gas will be looked at mainly through the heat working group, which, which is looking in this area. And I think that's really important is that we don't look at gas in isolation. We have to look at what we use gas and other sources for, which, which is heating. Um, that contributes uh, almost half of our, of our energy use. And so it's really, really, really important for the, for the strategy to, to tackle. Um, I think what we can say at the moment is around 70% of our heat comes from oil. And that's, that's a huge issue for us to tackle here in Northern Ireland. It means that gas is still obviously very much a minority in terms of how we, how we uh, heat our homes and businesses, but a growing minority and becoming increasingly more important as we go along. But I think when we talk about gas, we need to think not just about what we have at the moment in the gas grid, uh, which is natural gas, which is lower emission than, than oil, but particularly what it could be in the future. I think when we're investing in gas, we're investing in infrastructure, which can house biomethane, biogas, um, and hydrogen, and, and fuels like that, which are zero carbon. Um, so I think that's an issue that has to be looked at through the strategy, but it's, it's one of the key ones that we, that we need to tease out. I think the other sort of question around smart meters, um, that's one that will be looked at by the consumer group. Um, I think smart meters, we don't want to again look at it sort of on its own. Um, smart meters feed into a much broader question around smart grids, around internet, around data, about how we give consumers access to and use of their data to empower them and to make them make their decisions better. So really, I suppose, on smart meters, we need to look at it in that sort of broader picture and see what's the right answer here. But ultimately, it'll be based on the evidence around um, is the cost of doing it, are the benefits coming from that that, that work for consumers? Um, and I think I think we, we do have a slight advantage here and that because we haven't rolled out smart meters to date, technology has moved on from when they would have been rolled out elsewhere. So we actually have a bit of an opportunity that if we do it here, we can be at the very forefront of the technology uh, rather than rather than sort of uh, from some of the older generation stuff. So again, both really big issues that have been raised and both things that we'll be looking at through the energy strategy working groups. And then just to add one final point, uh, Chair, the, 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 the mention of hydrogen there uh, comes to the issue of electrolysis. Electrolysis is something you're going to hear about and we're going to hear about an awful lot into the future. Electrolysis is where electricity is used to, to produce hydrogen and oxygen. Um, that, that electricity could be the electricity that at the moment is dispatched down by the system operator. We heard earlier that um, we, you know, we, the, the, some of the wind on the system can't be used because there isn't a demand, for example. And I, and I think on average in the first quarter of this year, that number was 15% of the available wind that couldn't get run. But that 15% of available wind that has been invested in can be run through uh, demands created by electrolysis machines. We can produ be producing hydrogen that can be used for heat, hydrogen that can be used for transport and the likes of uh, heavy goods vehicles and buses and so on. So th then we also have the oxygen side of the equation there. And certainly I know that there is some interesting discussion ongoing with NI Water about how oxygen can be used in wastewater treatment to increase the capacity of their of their of their plants. So, you know, this is this is a circular economy. This is a massive opportunity and it's one which we we won't be waiting for the for the uh, strategy to land next year before doing something about it. That's great. I think on the gas, just we those of us have been on this committee for a while, you know, there's been huge investment in the infrastructure and gas throughout Northern Ireland. So I think we need to encourage an uptake of gas rather than maybe diversify and move away from it. I think we should capitalise on the investment. When you think of the gas to the west, there's gas now in the northwest and there's gas well on its way into South Down. So, you know, there's we have a huge network and I think it's it's you know important that we continue to especially in the domestic market, promote it and try and encourage you, the uptake. Thanks very much, Thank everyone. You. Thanks, Chair. Thank
Thanks. Um, j just a couple of final from myself. Um, I see in relation to um, John's points around the, the mutuals and the cooperatives, um, and also in terms of the, the general cost of energy, um, but in terms of um, being able to finance the, the transition, has any kind of consideration been given to that and the level of investment that might be needed um, and the type of incentives you know, to encourage people to, to transition to different um, energy provision? Maybe we'll say the, about the research piece about financing that we're, we're doing. Yeah, 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 happy to. Um, so it's, it's a good question. It's a really important one that has come up obviously an awful lot um, through prior to the call for evidence, during the call for evidence and, and in the responses. So there are, um, there's a, I suppose there's a number of initiatives happening uh, already at, at different levels in Northern Ireland and the Belfast Climate Commission, for example, is involved in some interesting thoughts around uh, the financing the just transition. So there's a lot of thinking going on on this topic, uh, you know, even outside of the department. But there's maybe two aspects of it from our perspective. So the first is understanding the, the, the costs and benefits, and that's where you know, the, the modelling work that we're doing is going to, to help us to understand you know, if, you, if, if we pull policy levers here, what will the financial cost be, what the financial benefits may be in relation to other policy levers. So that's, that's an understanding issue, and that's really important. The second part is then, of course, the financing itself. Um, there are... There, there will be a need for for finance and different types of finance, and we we recognise that we need to get a, a much better handle on the as well the channels of finance that are available, the tools that are out there, and what could be used in 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 Northern Ireland usefully. So one of the pieces of research that we want to commission is specifically on that topic. It's it's financing the energy transition, and it's asking those questions. You know what what tools can be used by by I suppose by central government uh, what kind of financing institutions are doing already green bonds for example we can see at a very specific level uh, the the uh, the green mortgages for example uh, it doesn't I think it's much more common in the Republic of Ireland at the moment um, and parts of other parts of the UK but where where you see green mortgages with lower interest rates for houses that are either are more energy efficient or are intending to become more energy efficient and or low carbon so the energy, the, the think piece, the piece of research will look at that specific question of financing and that, that then will require, um, I suppose, then op options for taking forward the strategy and how that finance needs to flow and where it needs to flow and at which level. Here, do you have a, a time frame around that piece of research? Um, well, we'd hope we, we haven't. It hasn't yet kicked off. Um, so we would be looking at for a lot of these pieces of research. It's in and around uh, October, probably. We're likely to see them. So it'll, it'll take a little bit of time, but that probably works out quite well from the academic perspective because a lot of them will be doing it over the summer. Good to hear. Um, look, thank you very much for that. I just want to ask one final question. Um, when the minister was in with us last, she mentioned um, in relation to RHI and um, the, the option for closure, she w may have proposals around that mid-May, so I was just wondering if there was any update in relation to that. Um, there's work um, close to fruition, Chair, on the future of RHI, and our expectation is the Minister will bring a, an update by way of a letter to executive colleagues uh, very eminently. Thank you very much. Um, that was really useful, and I'm sure we'll be keeping in touch with you on it all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. When did he say that update? Imminently. Oh, imminent. Yeah, right. Okay. Thank you. Executive. Must okay. have. There's a letter to be a letter to executive. Okay. Um, moving on then to um, matters arising. Um, Okay, 6.1 of your packs. There is a response from the House of Commons Treasury Select Committee at page 50 on the problems experienced by self-employed people using the HMRC portal. And the chair indicates that HMRC are taking steps to resolve this issue and will monitor it. Um, Peter, you want to add Yeah, that? Chair, they, they actually are going to fold this into their inquiry around the COVID-19 response. Um, 
because there, there are obviously the issues that the committee has identified and has been in communication uh, with representatives at Westminster about. Um, they've also made reference there to the fact that um, our local MPs have put down questions mm. uh, across the piece to a variety of different ministers in pretty much every context they could. So I, I guess what they're saying there is that it's, it's been a well-covered issue. Um, but I, I think I'm right in understanding that it's still the helpline. There isn't, there isn't an electronic um, mm -hmm. fix yet, no. which yeah. is really what, what was being pushed for. Um, I don't have any recent intel on how the helpline is working in terms of waiting times or anything like that. I don't know if members have any update on that. But it was the electronic fix, really, that was going to be a much better solution. And I, I think people are still using the telephone system. Um, there has been people there at success, but yeah. it takes a while. That's yeah. basically the feedback I've been getting. It seems to be, Chair. Unfortunately, Chair, that seems to be a system that still exists. It's a long way, yeah. but, but people eventually do seem to get through. But I appreciate the frustration about the whole thing, and hopefully it'll be resolved soon. Chair, no one has clarified for us, and it has been asked why an electronic um, solution can't be found. Um, I might just actually um, talk to the, the Treasury Select Committee um, team around if they're going to be looking at something like that in terms of the inquiry and so on as well, just because I think there's going to be something can be done. Yeah, it's really not a new issue. No, no. Okay, moving on then to item number 6.2 is a copy of a letter from the Minister to Claire Sugden uh, at page 51 around the support for social enterprises. You will also see the uh, result of Social Enterprise NI survey um, at page 32 of table papers um, and you will note in it that um, in, in the responses um, that were received to the survey that um, 50% of social enterprises meet the size criteria for the hardship fund, but they're all charitable status, so none of them are actually um, eligible. Yeah. So obviously that, that's something that we have highlighted to um, the department and the ministers and, and, and we need well. to push for um, a resolution to in terms of um, social enterprises being able to access the supports. Chair, the, the, um, the, the, the solution seems to depend now on the... Um, bringing forward of the, the community's charities fund. Uh, the Minister referred to that um, when she was the committee before. Um, but as members are aware, it's the size of that fund may well be the problem. Um, and again, the committee has written to the Minister um, and other ministers, including Finance Minister and First and Deputy First Ministers, to highlight again that potentially the um, June monitoring round may allow an identification of funding that could be both put into the Charities Fund, specifically um, aimed at helping social enterprises with charitable status, but also some being put into the Hardship Fund so that the criteria can be widened out. The um, Minister had indicated that th they have done a modelling exercise so they know what particular sectors and segments it would cost to bring them into the scheme. So I suppose that's basically where, where we are likely to be uh, in terms of being able to help the businesses that currently aren't being helped. We have our own um, okay. done our own piece of work on that. Page 41 yeah. of the table papers, there is um, the results of the um, responses that we see from sectors detailing businesses that aren't able to access support and um, you can see the, yeah, the, uh, the range that's there. Um, so Chair, we, we seem to be particularly, and I think that they did a really um, made a really good effort in responding, but um, it's as members have said before, the entertainment and leisure sector um, just seems to miss on, on every account. Um, they pay extremely high rates. Um, they have furloughed staff, but at the minute, there, there's, it's difficult for them to be able to um, get their businesses up and running again. And we've also highlighted previously the small manufacturing. Yeah. Um, and the option of using the de-rated de NAV um, to include more um, of the small and medium. Yeah. Um, that's been highlighted to That's been the highlighted minister. to the Minister um, and also uh, moved on to finance as well. Okay. 
That report, Chair, on 41, will we send that to the Department or send it to the Minister? We will do, Chair. There, there's still some, we, we, we think that there's probably still a few to come in that might just add a little bit of um, depth, if you like, that are, there may be ones that we weren't already getting from different sectors. So once we've got that completed, um, our intention is then to take that to the Department, um, just to highlight. Having looked at it, the, We've highlighted the sectors generally, but this actually gives figures and evidence. No, that's good. It's good work, thanks. The other thing, Chair, would a number of these businesses be eligible for the rates relief, which is yet to be um, finalised? Yeah, well, and that's where we're hoping that that'll be another way to take some of these businesses off the, the list, effectively, of those who aren't getting any help at all. We know that work's ongoing. It's just we're not entirely sure expansive it will be. We flagged that up, Chair, to both the Finance yeah. Committee and the Finance Minister um, as a priority, and I'm, I'm hopeful that that the will minister, conclude soon. The Minister did make the point to some of us in, in the Assembly that it needs, um, needs legislation to, to finalise this. Chair, potentially yes, but um, my assumption on that would be that an accelerated passage can be looked at and it can be done pretty quickly um, if, if that's going to be necessary and we still have um, time for that to be done. Again I think there may be some um, feeling of trying to look to the June monitoring round and see just exactly what can be repurposed, what's out there, um, whether the rating is the solution above other kinds of grants and so on. So. I suppose it's really we're at a point now where we know who the people are who are not getting support. We have a variety of potential solutions. It's now identifying funding to, to see which one will be best. Okay. Okay. Just on the hardship fund that is running, can we get an update on the um, uptake of that? Yeah, I think that would be yeah, very yeah. useful. Please, and see what the, the budget is like, or possibly like. I mean, there is still that issue, and I know a, I've raised it in every corner I went into about the sole trader, and, and a lot of people here have too, to be fair. issue It's still ongoing, and I, a, I suppose there's a real hurt out there in relation to it, and, yes, and absolutely. real concern and pain about it. Um, it's one we have consistently raised with the Minister as well. There is a response here from the, the Finance Minister mm -hmm. later on in the pack as well, um, in relation to it, and obviously um, in discussions with the Minister and, and the Permanent Secretary we've had um, that it is being looked at in terms yeah. of June monitoring so I think it would be really important that those yeah. categories are included. Like Gordon you say there is real um, dismay yeah. at the, the lack of support for those in particular who haven't been able to access any support and I think it is something that really needs to be addressed. It's, it's probably one of the longest groups that, that have yep. been campaigning for in terms of ex expectation of being able to access funds. Um, and I think we are at a point now where everyone has, has seen that they are the ones that need it. They've been identified as a quantum um, and it's really now a case of identifying sufficient funds to widen out criteria of the hardship fund and then I suppose the other sector particularly that's been highlighted uh, most across social media and so on social economy. And it's looking to seeing whether the um, charity fund can be supplemented and, and can ensure that the criteria fit those enterprises. Chair, why we're on this discussion, because there is so much we could talk about on it, um, just a few points. I don't think this, the self-employed one is a scandal. It really is. I mean, you, we get the calls. It's, it's shocking. Um, and even if we could be creative, I mean, there are some who have fallen through the cracks because they're not getting the self-employment scheme. And because they haven't been trading long enough and they're not getting rate relief because they don't have business premises. But if we could create a system whereby if you were getting a small business support from HMRC, maybe you qualify, that would reduce the 30 or 40 or 50,000 down to a manageable number because we're like, cognizant of the fact there's not money everywhere, but at least it would help those who are getting nothing. Um, the rate relief is going to be helpful when businesses are back up and running for their bottom line mm. because of reduced turnover. But then if you're not, if you can't survive in time to get back open again, it's irrelevant. Plus, who would want to pay rates if you can't open your company anyway? So I do think we need to get more. Hardship grant is a big one. Look, we're, I'm still getting people who still haven't got their 10 grand and their 25 grand, and they will be processed and assessed and passed mm -hmm. on as they were available. 
the hardship grant isn't going to be paid until every the application process is closed and then it's assessed and then it's how much is there to divvy up between all the applicants. We don't know how long that's going to be. I'm getting calls, people saying, like, I'm in hardship now. Where is that money? I said, well, the, there's weeks to go on the deadline and because they don't know it's the, it's, the mil, it's the total divided by the amount of applicants. It's, yeah. So it's, you can't pay out until you know what they are. Yeah, that was the thing. It was a finite quantum, and that was one of the reasons why the criteria were set tighter than yeah. perhaps had been anticipated. And again, that's going to fall into, I suspect, if they can find, if they can identify more funding in the June monitoring round, mm -hmm. then the criteria can be widened out. But then you also then have to open up an application process to those people. Okay, yeah. So I think probably trying to find out how the mechanism of that will actually work. If members are content, we'll get pinned down detail on that. Yeah, and one more point we'll come to, we might as well talk about now, is, is the grant for multiple premises. I know it's further on share, but if we just talk about it slightly, I mean, there are any amount of premises or businesses that have multiple stores. Ten grand, as I said the other day, to a single occupier in a retail shop is quite a lot, and it will keep him or her going for quite a long time. And if you're managing 15 stores mm -hmm. and you've got 150 staff in your books, ten grand isn't a day's isn't a day's takings. It's not a day's turnover, and it's not a day's wages. So it's almost it's ten grand. Yes, we'll take it, but it's almost meaningless comparatively speaking. I mean, if if we could maybe I haven't asked yet, but I maybe think we maybe look to write to the minister, the finance minister, to see if something can be done, even on a you know a percentage or pro rata basis for the amount of businesses and premises they have, to see if we could do something for them. Chair, it is one we've identified um, with both ministers, finance and economy. It's also captured in the surveying we're doing. Yeah, uh, there's some sure. really well set out examples there. So if members are content, as well as sending that to the economy minister, we'll also send it to the finance minister and finance committee. Yeah. Um, it, it just means that you know the, the evidence is being put out there and they can they can see it. The helpful. way we've structured it, it, it highlights very clearly multiple premises, how many staff are on furlough and what sort of you know cash flow they're getting and so on and whether they're qualifying for any other supports, rates, etc. Um, it, it does make for stark reading in those terms. So okay. We will circulate that to both if members are content once we've and got. And the last thing I promise, um, if they if we did know money was coming forward in June morning round for social enterprises, if they could see that they were going to get something, they could maybe at least borrow against the prospect of that coming. They're all a lot of companies are really worried to say, I don't want to run up more debt here if I don't know there's a grant coming down the line or can I even justify it. Um, that might be an option if we could give them some clarity. I don't know how, how easy that's going to be. Chair, what I would say is that's actually going to be really difficult purely because don't know we don't problem. know what's going to come out of the monitoring <laughs> yeah. round and where the other pressures lie. Yeah. We, we see going forward that um, work has begun again on various aspects of Brexit and looking to re-establish funds for that. Mm -hmm. um, planning going forward. So I think there are... I suppose the simple answer is we won't know until we, we no. get the, the outcomes of the, the monitoring now. But all of the issues have and will be flagged up. We'll complete the surveying within the next few days, so it'll be well over to the ministers uh, on the Finance Committee before the monitoring rounds and So it's, it's there, ready and waiting to go if there's money um, available for that. John O'Dowd is looking at Yes, in. yes, Chair. John, can you hear us? Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to echo your comments and the comments of other committee members around the hardship fund, and in particular the sole traders, uh, all this talk of opening up the economy and uh, moving forward is, is baffling some of the sole traders I'm talking to because these, these guys, uh, and I use that term in terms of women and men, are uh, facing financial ruin. They have no income coming in whatsoever. Uh, their businesses run from their homes, wherever it may be, are, are, are shut down. So I, I always work on the business, on the basis where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, and if the minister has a will to broaden out the criteria around the hardship fund or secure funding for uh, the sole traders, then that can be done. We, we had the battle over student hardship fund. We had the battle over the hardship fund. So let, let, let's keep the effort up in terms of ensuring that sole traders do receive some form of funding now, which will allow them to have businesses when the economy opens up again. 
Sure, can I raise one other thing just on that? I think I think we should maybe a committee try and encourage movement on the uh, non food retail opening. And I know it's strictly not, but I think we have a good forum here for people that are out and about in the community and we know what is happening. If we look at the appetite there is for the B and Q stores and IKEA, you know, and the excitement that people get out of it <laughs> which I'm not sure about, but but I, I must admit I the last <laughs> key lights. The last <laughs> Saturday morning, it's the last three Saturday the mornings. Are I've been <laughs> at, at the B and Q store <laughs> and uh, I've, I've had to wait sometimes for forty minutes and I've had to wait I suppose that was the maximum, sometimes ten or twelve minutes. The last three Saturday mornings have been at B and Q. It's that sad but too much time in your hands. The weather the weather <laughs> was great, but it, I'm making the point it is Saturday. Mm -hmm. But um, people to be fair, I think people if the the stores are put in the proper um, social distancing and hygiene uh, systems in place. I think the public are are ready to go out and do shopping, and I really do think we need to encourage um, encourage the executive to look closely at this non the is it the non food retail stores opening within our high streets. Our high streets are dead. They're dead, and and you know in our towns and in our villages and, and the cities. And I think we should, perhaps I'd appreciate the you know, opinion of other members on that. I think we should do all we can to encourage opening up other units like, with obviously the right measures in place. And I believe the public are, are ready for it and, and want to see it. And um, I think you know, there is that um, real hunger to, for certain people to get out to, to shop. And I think it's, it's so positive in a way that it returns a bit of normality. It, it gives people a, a, a positive feel to get, get out and purchase things that they've, they've been longing to do. And of course, we need to uh, remember that the, the health advice and the scientific advice is, is paramount in all of this. But there's a, there's a very difficult balance. And I do think we need to, to encourage the executive to look at those issues. To say, I would appreciate the opinion of other members on this. I think the, um, John, the, 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 plan, the ability to plan and the announcement of the date of the 8th of June was, was very welcome last week. Obviously tomorrow I think we get the, the whether or not that's going to go ahead on the advice of the CMO and I suppose that, that may guide the ability then to make further announcements around potential dates. Um, John O'Dowd is looking in there, yes, did you sure. say? John, did you want to come in? Yeah, um, now I know how Gordon spends the Saturday mornings. I'm, I'm worried about him. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I thought Gordon would have been a golfer or something, but there you go. But in terms of, look, I think this falls into the, the questions we've been asking about the, the engagement forum. Uh, the, the chair is quite right in terms of the executive process and exec, the executive work that's going on around the opening up of the economy in a safe uh, way. But I think the point Gordon made is also, and we've, we've heard from traders and the various trading organisations that are out there, uh, but we, we haven't, I don't think we've received the information we requested back about uh, the engagement form, because I think that's key to us understanding uh, the safety, the measures required, the support required uh, for those businesses moving forward. But even if we get the high street opened up again, it's not going to help sole traders. There are many sole traders, so... We do have to concentrate as well on the sole traders uh, uh, moving forward. Chair, if it's helpful, um, the the briefing that that the committee has had has all now been made into letter form and, and has gone to the minister, and we're starting now to get responses back on that. That's all being shared as well with the LRA forum, and they were looking at um, various models of safe reopening. They've been gathering them. Um, from from various different sources, a lot of organisations, a lot of sectors, a lot of industries now, um, both here, um, GB Europe are now publishing how they're, how they're guiding their, their way back to reopening. Also, um, members will recall the briefing with Solis and Nilger where they indicated the role that com the councils have. That again has all gone now to the minister and we're starting to get responses back. We have a response to our first um, letter that we put in a month ago now, 
um, with the briefings that we'd had at that stage. So I'm expecting those to start rolling back. So I know the issues are being registered and they're starting to be dealt with. Where I suppose um, the key thing needs to happen is, is the council's role with the executive and a clear line of responsibility there is right, councils have that role of managing the queuing and so on. Um, but we flagged all that up. That That is all there for, for both the Minister and the, the LRA. Chair, can I come in on that? Yep. Um, you're absolutely right. I'm with Gordon in this. I do think we need some clarity for our non-food retailers. Um, I mentioned, made the point before, when a retailer I were presenting to is about seasonal stock and things. You know, mm. For those of us who are in their style and their shoes and their clothes, you know, a business needs to know if it's going to be open in the spring or the summer or the winter. You know, to give that t- time to plan, to order in stock, to be prepared, because we're talking about months, a month ahead now for certain sectors. You know, that's what they need to know. They need to have that idea. Are they going to be open this summer? You know, can we give them some sort of clarity? Um, so I, I do think it's important that we can give something because people want to know. Also, on the councils, like we're seeing a, a council by council approach here. We're, what's a, the council's been completely, the company's been broken down into 11 different um, authorities uh, and who are making judgments on what can and can't open. I made the case before for state agents reopening because the housing market is paramount to the economy. And Mid and East Anton Council made the decision, yep, yeah, go ahead, do vacant properties. Other estate agents are phoning me from different areas now saying, why can't they go and do it? And, well, because your council environment and health hasn't signed it off. We can't have an 11 different approaches to, to this. We have to have a clear communication. Uh, and we need this, the guidance set out for all the sectors. I know it's difficult, but each one needs to be able to open so they can adhere to the guidance, get their insurance in place and get back on the road. Um, how that's done, <laughs> communication is key. We, we do. We have the the um, chair. We have the the state agent letter in the pack, and we yeah. we come to that because I I have a I would say if it went a to, plan if it, for that, but I I have a route for that. If it went to court, if there was an opportunity to do oh, so, other estate right. agents would send it. You know, the precedent's been set by one environment the health. Junior, it's just legal advisors interpreting the same guidance. So what is the difference? Guys, are going in. Yes, as well, Chair. And yeah. um, Thanks, Chair. I don't know yeah. why I agree with the comments that have been made. I think that the indicative timings issue is one which uh, isn't going to go away. Um, and I find that you know, when, when announcements are made, such as the ones around uh, hotels and caravan sites, is that when you get that uh, announced, obviously then comes in a hundred other questions around uh, specifics relating to that. You know, with hotels, you know, can can bars open? Can can seating areas open with caravan sites? Does that include touring caravans? What about the facilities on site? I think it is important that we get clarity ASAP around the engagement forum. I think there's enough expertise around the table to ensure that when announcements are made, absolutely, I think it gives clarity. But at the same time, along with that uh, clarity of timing, it's important that there is clarity around the uh, processes and procedures that need to be in place within each individual sector. And that's something that I find uh, sometimes just quite frustrating in the fact that when we do get an announcement, it's great. But then the, the questions are focused, I suppose, more on MLAs individually than the, the actual department. And I think that that's maybe something that we have to work around going forward. But I would like to just see some more clarity around that engagement forum. Sinead? Yes, uh, I would agree with John Stewart and, and Gary totally. I think uh, the communication, um, albeit there's been great efforts made, it still is failing uh, to engage with the public because the public seem to be a way ahead of the, the, the comms at the minute. And businesses really do need time, uh, time frames um, in order to prepare. Um, it'll not be an easy process getting um, opened up and putting all of uh, the social distancing regulations, etc., in place. They need times and they need them as soon as possible. So I would endorse that. Uh, and I, I think if we even, um, uh, you know, make our, as, as a committee, make our feelings very clear to, to the executive um, that businesses need more clarity and indicative time scale. Yeah, OK, Peter is informing me with correspondence. That, that, all that, that, that has gone into the correspondence thus far. It has been... Early length, so what we might do might be helpful for members as we recirculate those. Yeah. Um, but they, they very much much match the lengthy memos that the members now 
I've seen before. Um, <laughs> yep. And I've come to expect. But um, it, it is, Chair, it's all issues that have been flagged. And, and I would just, I suppose, it really has come to the point where, um, in terms of specifics, particularly the non food retail, is going to be the executive and councils talking about process. Mm. So, um, village, town, city centre management. Um, and of course, in, this, in, the, in terms of cities, a lot of towns now, that, that's also. You've got a management group or a management mm. um, person who are going to need to be included in this as well. The, the Solis and Nilga I know have briefed us and told us that they briefed the communities committee and told them that it's been now moved to ministers as well. So it, it's making sure that there is that join up between the executive and Solis and Nilga so they can yeah. pin that down so that the advice is getting around. The forum is looking at all that advice. They have everything that we've had. Um, I know they've made some recommendations. I suppose it's really not just now the executive applying those. The other thing we flagged up was potential cost, um, where the, the councils wanted identification of who would pick up the cost for screening, queue management systems, and, and all those kinds of things. So I suppose that all needs to be worked out as well, but it's, it's going to be the executive and councils that really have to pin that down. Yeah, and Solis is represented on the engagement yep. forum, um, and we have um, reflected that we want to see good engagement between the executive and everything in terms of our Every correspondence. So, <laughs> clarity and communication have become the watchwords. Um, Will we try and get through these matters. Yes, today? yes. Okay. <laughs> Of a tangent there. Um, Six point three. There is a ministerial letter at page fifty three informing the committee that the minister has written to the minister for business, energy, and industrial strategy, agreeing that the North is included in the transposition of three articles contained in the EU Energy Performance of Buildings Directives, twenty eighteen. Um, members will. Um, know perhaps that the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive was amended in 2018 as part of the EU Clean Energy Package and sets out a broad range of requirements for Member States to help boost the energy performance of buildings. DFE officials have reviewed the statutory instrument in discussion with Department of Finance officials and have confirmed it is in line with policy here. So um, BEZ is going to lay the statutory instrument today, um, so it's for noting unless there's anything else. Great. Okay. okay. Um, page 54 of your packs for item 6.4 is a men response from the Minister for Health at um, providing an update on the graduate entry med uh, school at McGee. So also for noting unless there's any action. Noted. Um, 6.5 and 6.6, .6, there's correspondence um, at page 56 and 58 from the Committee for Infrastructure, urging the Economy Minister to produce a fully costed financial package for the taxi, taxi industry and the road haulage industry. Okay, um, so we will write to the Department indicating committee support for, for those. I think there are issues about that, about who is responsible. Yeah. Do we need yeah. to encourage collaboration there? Yeah, not a bad term. Do you think part of the confusion is the, this, the issue used to sit with another department? And then was moved. There isn't necessarily full clarity there, so I think the committee writing to seek clarity and, and encourage clarity would be helpful. Yeah. Um, I'm looking retrospectively now here. It's just the the, the letter from um, the Department of Health regarding the graduate entry medical school. It's it, it's just noteworthy, uh, uh, you know, for us. Um, but this is a f very time to find um, a project we need to sign off within the next week. Uh, and um, it's urgent. So I think that we should reply to say, that, you know, to, to indicate the urgency of sign off within the next, well, 12th of, of June was the date mentioned by the department originally. So um, we're very near that date now. Chair, if I could just clarify. Um the, the end of, of um, May date was the commitment for the GMC. Chair, can, can the Deputy Chair just remind me what the 12th of June cutoff was? The 12th of June cutoff was uh, when the announcement was made on the 18th of May by the Deputy First Minister. They um, indicated that instead of a decision being made or needed to be made 
uh, for the GMC by the end of May that they now have been able to move it to the 12th of June. Um, so the, the GMC, that, that, that sign-off is required uh, by that date. Okay, Chair, we'll, we'll check that one out and yeah. um, we'll, we'll reinforce the committee's support for, for the different ministers and so on, and Chair. And, and then the other unmovable date, unmovable date completely, is um, the, the, the intake of students have to set a stat, uh, an exam, and that takes place in mid-July. And so that's completely unmovable. So we really literally have um, a, a few weeks to get this over the line. John Dowd. Uh, Chair, I have slight concerns about the motivation sometimes of the McGee school being raised in the committee. Uh, it ends up as negative press uh, in the dairy media, suggesting that the executive commitment to building uh, and installing the medical school in McGee uh, is, is not uh, honourable. Uh, and it's quite clear now that the executive and, and the, the executive office have taken responsibility for delivering this project. Now, quite rightly, committees will scrutinise and ask questions. That is their duty, and individual members will do that. But if, we're, if the committee is going to be used in, in a way which is which is party political, then I do have concerns about that because unless uh, Sinead has definitive evidence that the executive commitment is not honourable, then I'm not sure the committee should get into this ping-ponging around this matter, which then allows for uh, headlines in some of the dairy press that McGee is not going ahead, or McGee's under threat, or McGee's, or the intention is not honourable. I, mean, I haven't been presented with any evidence yet that would back that case up. Sorry, John, can I respond to you here? I, I'm a member of this economy committee. There is a, a paper in front of me, a response in front of me, and I'm responding to that. So whether the public out there are listening to this economy committee and choose to write something about it, I have no responsibility at that. But I do have a responsibility to the constituents uh, that I represent. And this is a major, major um, uh, project for the North West. And I will not for my responsibility of critiquing and asking questions. This is a time-defined project that requires uh, urgent uh, sign-off, and I make no apologies for what I've said and what I will continue to do, and I'll do it next uh, week probably, and I'll probably do it the week after that, because it's that important. And sorry, John, if, if that uh, is making you uncomfortable. Well, let, let me repeat what I said. Uh, Committees should scrutinise and must scrutinise. Members must scrutinise. That, that is their duty. I would never stand in the way of anyone doing that. I do have a problem with a committee is being used for a party political process. And that's the concern I'm raising. Um, if, if someone can present me with evidence that the executive commitment to build and have a medical school at McGee is not an honourable commitment, then I Sorry, we're losing the line. Chair, we're losing the line. Yeah. Sorry, folks. Sorry, excuse me. Sorry. Part of the chair, I can't see you. The point is that the executive commitment will not be carried through, but that doesn't stop anyone, and nor would I ever stand in the way of anyone scrutinising the work of the executive office. Or any other, or any other department for that matter. Thank you both. Um, Gary, you want to come in? Oh. Yeah, just very briefly. Um, look, uh, I appreciate the medical school is a topical one, uh, particularly for us in the northwest. Can I just get clarity? Obviously, um, the letter clearly states that. The executive office is now coordinating work on this matter. So, uh, look, I, I think it is important that uh, our focus is there. Uh, and, and, you know, have we as a committee, uh, just to get clarity, I know we've written to the health minister, obviously, but have we written to uh, the first and deputy first ministers just around, obviously, the, the committee's view on this, but also the need for the urgency? Look, I, I like all elected reps, you know, I, I think that, the executive's well aware of the urgency around this and a commitment has been given to deliver and we need to, we need to trust that that's going to be the case. But have we put that on record to the First and Deputy First Ministers? Sorry, we've had 
previously written to the economy, health and finance ministers, uh, that was before the announcement that it was taken into the executive office. So we will uh, now also write to the, the, first, in, the first ministers on that. Um, and obviously we, we all recognise that that commitment has been given in relation to um, the project going ahead. So we will Just pick yeah, that up. Chair for clarity, yeah. Also, thank you. We do have to be mindful. Obviously, we are all on the committee, and we all will have our questions. I know, you know, like and, and you know, she made rightly has spoken up, and likewise, you know, we all will will question whatever evidence comes forward on, on the committees, and um, in our own particular way and with our own perspectives. So we have to be mindful of that. Uh, not just in the case of the medical school, but indeed in the case of Sony as well. Uh, we, we all come at these things from different angles and we should have the space to question it, but we shouldn't do it in a way that, you know, it's about trying to get a headline in the newspaper either. I think it's about being genuine and ensuring that we can we can get these things over the line. Thanks, Chair. Sorry, and that's a, a very fair point. Um, we're moving on then off, to... Item 6.7, which is correspondence of page 60 of the pack from Mega Network, which represents manufacturing and engineering companies in Mid Ulster, um, around the need for government support to implement manufacturing and engineering initiative in Mid Ulster. Um, we're going to forward this on to the department, but I just wanted to highlight the particular issue is in relation to apprenticeships, um, and obviously there is an immediate um, concern there in terms of apprentices who are partly through a, a course um, and some concern around whether employers will be able to keep apprentices on and um, if there is uh, some thinking around that going on within the department at the minute and it would be really useful to get some feedback around that. Chair, I'm, I'm in the process of, we, we nearly talked yesterday on the phone but the, the plenary debate on the insolvency LCM started and I had to stop. So I'm talking to Maria Curran on the phone about that, so we'll try and organise briefing. Great. But it feeds into the um, the wider issue, and it's one of the things that we'll pick up again, Chair, with the FE Colleges next week. Mm -hmm. uh, Are they coming next week? Yes, we've got them, Chair, on Tuesday the 9th. We've got three meetings next week. <laughs> right. Uh, but they're, it, the, the Monday and Tuesday are very short. Okay, good. Short. Okay. Great, yeah. <laughs> um, Six point eight. There's a response from the minister at page nine of table papers um, on a number of issues raised by the committee. Um, so the committee is due to have another briefing from the minister, and we think it's the seventeenth of June. We're, we're, it could be next week, but we're 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 just not sure. We we're, we've we've got a, a number of things we're looking at for either the tenth or the seventeenth. So it'll be one or the other. We're we're. Just pinning it down, Chair. So we'll have the opportunity to pick up with the uh, Minister again. Um, there is correspondence at page 18 of the table papers from the Committee for Finance regarding letters it is sent to the Economy and Finance Ministers around groups excluded to, from COVID-19 support. So the supports are ongoing mm -hmm. calls for further support. Um, so we're for noting unless members of anything else, because we've discussed it at length today. Um, there is a copy of a response from the Finance Minister that I referred to previously at page 24 of Table Papers regarding support for sole traders. Um, obviously we have discussed that issue as well. Um, there is a press statement at page 26 of Table Papers regarding the cap imposed by the Department for Education in England on the number of English domiciled students that can attend um, education providers here um, in 2020-21. Um, the Minister has written to the UK's Universities Minister on this issue. Obviously, members will be aware that this will have some impact on our local universities who are already under pressure. Um, so, if members are agreed, we would write to the universities, um, to Queen's, to Ulster, probably also to Stranmalos and St yeah, Mary's yeah. Um, on that issue. Agreed. Um, 6.12, then there's a response from the department at uh, page 28 of table papers to correspondence uh, the committee received from Claire Hanna MP regarding small business support. So if members are agreed, we will forward a copy of that on to Claire. Great, yeah. Um, and then 6.13, there's a response from the department at page 31 of table papers regarding the enterprise barometer survey carried out at enterprise N by enterprise NI. Sorry. Um, so if members are agreed, we will forward that on to Enterprise NI. Agreed. Okay, then moving on to item 7, which is um, the protocol um, EU exit. There is a clerk's memo at page 49 of table papers 
which provides a summary of the protocol papers. Um, at 7.1 to 7.6 are briefing papers from Research and Information Services, page 64 to 183. The papers cover customs and trade, tax and excise duties, employment, state aid and the single electricity market. There is also a paper from the Cabinet Office at page 199 outlining the UK's approach to the um, protocol. Um, there is a briefing paper from the House of Commons Library, Library sorry, at page 222 on the Shared Prosperity Fund. Um, there is a memo from the EU's Affair Manager at page 51 of your table papers on the publication of the House of Lords report on the protocol. Um, there is a document on the future of UK carbon pricing, uh, UK government and devolved administration's response at page 52 of table papers, the result of a consultation on the future of carbon, price, carbon pricing in the UK after Brexit. There is an institute for government paper on the implementation of the protocol at page 120 of table papers and there is a European Commission technical note on the implementation of the protocol at page 191 of table papers. Pierre. So, Chair, I acknowledge, um, and members, I apologise that that is a veritable ocean of papers. Um, I, I do not propose to, <laughs> to force a discussion on those now. Good. Um, there's, a, <laughs> there's a short memo, a very short memo, a shockingly short memo, Chair, um, just setting out what the papers are, that they they deal with pretty much every aspect of the protocol and EU exit that we've kind of flagged up as a committee. Um, and it, it gives members an opportunity to have that information sitting in front of them, um, drawing in a lot of sources. The, the, the six raised papers are particularly good at that in terms of you know what's being said, what's happening. So what, what I would suggest here at this point is, is that um, members take those away, absorb them, um, have a think about them, and we'll, we'll schedule then further discussion. Um, we, we have a, we've organised an informal discussion with uh, Paul Grocott and the Permanent Secretary okay. on EU issues, because I'm just very conscious of the fact that a, a committee briefing session doesn't necessarily give the opportunity for that kind of informal exchange. Yeah. So we, we, we've organised an informal uh, way to do that. Um, on Thursday the 18th of June instead of a, a normal sort of triage session. Um, again, that'll provide members a bit of time to read the papers and think about what they might want to look at. When are we getting our briefing from the Brexit? So we were going to do that on the 17th and the 1st of July, but what we're doing then is we're having Paul on the 18th informally and then we'll have the officials on the 1st of July as a collective group. As members will recall, theoretically by the 1st of July, we will know what's going to happen. Well, not, not the detail of what's going to happen, but at least the direction of what's going to happen. That's our, our kind of tipping point time. Um, the papers have a number of questions within them. Chair, yes. So I, it would be useful if we could maybe get some responses in relation to those prior to that briefing. Is that so, Chair, that's, that's what we intend to do um, as an action. Each of the research papers has a number of scrutiny points for the department. So if members are content, Chair... We will forward those now uh, after the meeting to the department and seek those to have a response by the time we have the informal discussion um, with Paul and the permanent secretary. Um, if members are content to do that, that will just give that bit more sort of information around um, issues that are likely to be raised. No, they're, they're useful. I think that it's Sorry, Chair Mangman. Two wee seconds. I was just saying they're very useful papers um, and it, with a lot of information and I think that it, um, just thanks to research and information <laughs> providing those as well. Um, go ahead, Sinead. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I just There was a very significant debate yesterday about the EU transition period and uh, the extension of that. Uh, uh, and it was supported um, <laughs> extremely well uh, by the body of the assembly. And I think you know it, it's up to this committee to to maybe study um, some of these papers. But we too probably need to make a recommendation if we do believe that the department is under pressure and that our business community uh, 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 and industry uh, uh, and we're hearing 
constantly from, from all of the briefings that we're getting that they feel under pressure as well because we can cope with one crisis but we can't cope with two major crises in a very short space of time um, one coming rapidly after the other so uh, you know that is a consideration um, the assembly has spoken and has used its voice very clearly uh, and, and it should be a recommendation that we would make to the executive Chair, if it's helpful, the, the Permanent Secretary will be um, part of the, the discussion with Paul Grocott uh, week after next and will be able to be in a better position to tell us where the um, resourcing is now gone with Brexit. Um, Chair, as, as the Deputy Chair has, has, has raised, the Department now has two massive issues to deal with um, in terms of both the COVID-19 impact response and the rebuilding and recovery but also um, depending on, on what happens at the end of June, where we, where we find ourselves with EU exit. So I think that provides an opportunity, Chair, for um, him to give him a clearer picture of where the, the resource pinches are. Um, and also, as I'd said, because it's informal, it allows members to discuss where they want to go, what sort of decisions they want to make. Obviously, we, we've got the recommendation um, from the the, the assembly, which we dealt with earlier on in matters arising in writing to the cabinet secretary, of secretary of state for the cabinet, cabinet Michael Gove. Um, so yeah, absolutely, that that should gather a lot of that up. I also chair. I'm aware that the executive office committee um, had um, Dr. Andrew McCormack in. He, he's head of international relations, uh, but also, um, if you like, the, the sort of uh, key person in terms of the, the, the EU exit effort. Um, from what he was indicating to that committee, they, they've they now put in place again the infrastructure they had in terms of staff and resource. I think a lot of those people were um, in the short term diverted to COVID-19 response, but they've been put back now um, to EU exit. So again, I think um, the Permanent Secretary will be able to give us more information on that. So hopefully there'll be an opportunity to gather all that up together and for the committee then to, to have a basis on which they have enough information to go forward with a recommendation as to what they want to do. Hopefully that's helpful. Yep, thank you. Okay, so moving on then to item number eight, which is correspondence. Um, there's correspondence from the Committee of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs at page 247 regarding EU emissions trading scheme which ceases on the 31st of December 2020 and the proposals for the U new UK scheme. The proposed UK scheme aims to link the EU scheme uh, with sorry, the EU scheme and will ensure a level playing field for the single electricity market. Um, so we we'll seek members agreement to forward that briefing paper on to the department for comment. Great. Thank you. Um, at page 256, there's a copy of correspondence from the Committee for Education to the Education Minister on the issue of newly qualified teachers gaining employment in September 2020. The committee agreed to forward a copy of the correspondence to us as policy responsibility for higher education is within our remit, so as to note unless members have any actions they wish to suggest. Great. Hey, thank you. Um, at Page 258, there's correspondence from Mid and East Anthem Council, and it's on that issue regarding the reopening of um, estate agents. The committee recently wrote to the chair of the engagement forum regarding potential safety procedures for the reopening of estate agents. Um, so, if members are agreed, we would now write to the Department for the Health, sorry for Health, to the Assembly Liaison Officer um, to seek a response. Um, this is the advice that's come from the Clerk of the Health Committee and how to deal with this, to request it um, to share the response with that committee also. Okay, thank you. Um, page 259, there is a copy of the Examiner of Statutory Rules 11 report. If members are content to note. Noted. Um, yeah. Page 268, there is correspondence from a sole trader regarding support for self-employed. Um, obviously, we've discussed this issue in detail today, but we'll forward that on to the department for a response as well, if members are agreed. Great, yeah. Agreed. Um, again, there's correspondence from a small business owner at page 269 regarding hardship grant eligibility. So um, we would include this query as part of the table of responses by the department. Uh, Chair, it, it gives us the information we need for that. Um, so we, we, we seek a response. Okay, thank you. 
um, correspondence then page 270 from the Presbyterian Mutual Society concerning the society's collapse in 2008 and questioning what steps have been taken to maximise the return from loans and mortgages and to enforce any security in regard to these. So we'll forward that to the Department for a response if members are content. Great, yeah. Thank you. Um, at page 275, there is a series of correspondence from a small business owner concerning access to financial support. So we will forward that to the Department for a response as well, if, committee, or if members are content. Yep, yeah, great. Um, page 283 then, there is correspondence from local retailers concerning the failure of government grant schemes to support multiple groups. Obviously we discussed that earlier as well. So we will forward that to the Department for a response. Great. Um, then page 199 of tabled papers, there is the latest summary of issues um, from the department. Are members content to note? Good. Thank you. Um, page 202 of tabled papers, there is correspondence from the think tank Pivotal, Pivotal even, regarding the um, series of briefing papers on how uh, the North recovers from COVID-19. Are members content to note for now? Yep. Right. Um, page 203 of table papers, there's a briefing paper from Queen's Research Task Force on its um, potential losses and the vital role of the university across various sectors in economic recovery. Um, this document raises a number of issues in terms of the need to align our policies and priorities as we emerge from the crisis. Um, if members are content that an informal briefing is scheduled with Queen's to discuss further. Great, yeah. That, yeah. Um, page 207 of table papers, there is correspondence from the Freight Transport Association regarding continued financial support, or sorry, financial hardship faced by hauliers um, re and requesting a tailored aid package. Um, and it's agreed earlier the committee will write to the department supporting the call for the committee um, by the committee for infrastructure for a financial package for the haulage industry, and we'll include this letter with that. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so that's us um, in relation yes, to correspondence. All the correspondence. So item number nine then, any other business? Chair, it would be possible we could write to the, to the Minister for Infrastructure, just urging that a decision on the North South Interconnector is, is progressed. We are very much aware that this has dragged on and dragged on for far too long. I think a decision one way or the other needs to be made. And I would, you know, urge that we do this as soon as possible. Try and get a, if hopefully, a positive decision on the matter. Chair, members are content. We can go ahead and do that. Yeah. Yep. Great. Thank you. Okay then. Um, so item number ten is the date, time, and place of the next meeting, and it is Monday at ten. <laughs> do you maybe want to give us a wee? Yeah, I can sorry, give you a bit of a run close. down on that. Um, so, members, as as I I mentioned previously, the. The committee to get through the briefings that it needs to get through to deal with a lot of the issues that have already been raised will we'll meet three times next week. Um, now, Monday and Tuesday will be the hour long, um, quick sort of style of meeting we did previously with just a single item of that briefing, and then that's it. There'll be no other um, work around, there'll be no correspondence or anything like that. So, on Monday, we're, we're talking to the Association of British Insurers. Members will recall we've had a lot of issues brought up to us around payment of insurance policies or non-payment um, more often than not. So they have agreed to come and basically talk through what exactly is going on with the industry. So we've got the, the representative of all um, the sort of major insurance companies and bodies and so on right across all the regions. So we're talking here, Scotland, Wales, England. Yeah. Um, it's all COVID related. It is, and then Tuesday will be again same slot time, eleven ten until eleven, and that's the FE colleges. Um, just to get that proper discussion with them, they they flagged up a lot of issues around where things are going to go with apprenticeships, other professional technical qualifications, recruitment for next year, quite a number of issues. So it'll last to deal with that discreetly again without any other items on the agenda, and then. The 10th, Wednesday, we're still pinning down. It will be largely departmental. Um, it might be the minister. The minister may be the following week. We might incorporate city deals. We're just we're just pinning that one down. Apologies, I don't have more info on that. But okay. the situation is fairly live and fluid. But Monday and Tuesday, 
will both be 10 until 11. Um, we'll be based in this room as normal for those that can be here. Um, if not, same ringing in um, details. Following week, it's just Monday and Wednesday. Week after, I think it's Monday and Wednesday. At the minute, we've programmed um, potentially as far as the 15th of July. We were going to try and do a project stratum briefing earlier. What we've learned from officials is that they won't have finished with the examination of, of um, tender applications until the 10th. So they can't really tell us anything until then. So we're looking at bringing them in the following Wednesday, which would be the 15th of July. Um, we're still working with that date and they're flexible and fluid on it. Um, but by that stage, we should be able to do things entirely virtually. So members could be anywhere and, and join in on that one. I'll be in Salisbury playing an exercise, but I'm happy to try and dial in. Okay. <laughs> well, it can be done on a phone, I think. You can, you can video call the on a phone, as long as you've got the right software. But the Starleaf should allow us to do all sorts of, of um, technical so things. What is next Monday? So next Monday is... You mean... The following Monday. The following Monday. So the following Monday after next week is the... Um, do you know what I'm going to look? I'm going to just go into this now. <laughs> Chair. It's, it's DFA in the Yes, sorry. Yes, Monday the 15th is. That was the first date we could get where they would actually have a clear picture um, of what was going to come out of the monitoring round. So that then feeds into potentially whether we've got the minister then on the Wednesday of that week or the ministry Wednesday next week again. That's to be pinned down. And if we... If we get the minister next week, um, we're hoping she can deal with city days. We're still pinning that one down as well. If we don't get her, then the following week, we will put in... The union supported employment? Yes. Remember, yep. um, we talked before about the um, 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 supported employment and learning yep. sector has a lot of the issues that a lot of the other sectors are talking about, but we've not heard from them yet. So NIUSA will, will basically be able to give us that briefing. So... At the minute, next Wednesday the 10th and Wednesday the 17th are fluid. We, we have a, a number of briefings we're likely to do, but it's just which day they happen on. That's grand. Um, what we'll do is by Monday we'll have a full forward work programme. In fact, I'd be hoping probably to put that out yeah, in Friday's paper. Yeah. Or when the paper for Monday will, or the pack for Monday will go out tomorrow. So it'll be in that, hopefully. Um, but again, very, very grateful, Chair, for members' patience forbearance and uh, willingness to keep these briefings running. There, there's just an awful lot of people out there who have something you know they really need to tell the committee about how COVID-19 yep. COVID has impacted them and so on. And I, I do appreciate it, as I know stakeholders do, that the committee has been so open um, and flexible to hearing briefings. And we do appreciate Peter's work and the staff's work even if it is 12 o'clock at night or almost, and we get the messages. Never stop, Mr Dunn, we never it stop. It is appreciated, and uh, your efforts have been noted. And we, so thanks for that. Oh, I appreciate that. Chair, I, I may true. just even have something important to tell us. Oh. Uh, ministers confirmed for the 17th. Okay. So next week, then, we will um, not have the minister. She will be the week after, so we'll settle what exactly is going to happen on the Wednesday. All right. Oh, sorry, well done, Peter and staff too. Appreciate that. No, the team have been amazing, and I, I uh, well done, I'm incredibly grateful to them. Burn the midnight oil, Peter. I think no, but it's there's just so much happening that's just. We'll take you out for a beer, all of you, whenever the pubs are open. How's that? We'll get you an orange juice <laughs> next year. Christmas. Um, yeah. Okay, folks. Then our it's next meeting is Monday, Monday. at ten a.m. in this room. Okay. Or by dialing, we we communicate. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.